Good day, brothers and sisters. This is the other Paul, and welcome back for another excellent stream, one that we have had scheduled for quite a while, and I've been very excited for a good long time. And now we're finally here, and I'm joined by my good friend Craig Trulia. Craig, how are you doing this fine Australian morning? Not good because I'm jealous. That's the most awesome opening to a YouTube show I've ever seen. <laughs> That's the plan. That's the plan. I thought you would have seen it before if you've seen my if you've seen my streams and content. <laughs> I I don't remember that. I remember the countdown one. That was the OG one, but yeah, this one I made because I, I wanted something cool and grand. I I that um, it's that was... it's a beautiful hymn what you're playing, by the way. Mm. Yeah, um, it is. It's my favorite, my absolute favorite. Um, it's because the the actual organ tune for it, it wasn't something I could just get like royalty free online. It was from a specific. Uh, organist on his website so i personally asked permission to use it and he gave it and it's all g and i still need to give him a little donation as a thank you but i, yeah, I really i really am partial to uh, um how could it be amazing love um how can it be da, 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 that one that, that's <laughs> right any of the old school organ ones that that's a real good one my wife and i um mm. sang that at our wedding actually yeah that's it and I, I deliberately chose um, that that hymn because it's like an English hymn and it's a beautiful organ one because every second trad Christian YouTuber either has a Latin or a Greek chant for their intro with just some uninspired slideshow like, oh, that, that image looks based in trad. Boom, slam that on there. I, I was deliberate with my image choice and I wanted a song, a hymn that like was actually cool, cool and meaningful to me and not just like just just latin and greek because oh look how trad and cool it is guys how awesome <laughs> so it was very deliberate choice I'm glad you recognized the excellence of this stream it, it's uh, definite definite excellence and it puts my content to shame oh yeah of course of course oh, oh that's just my channel in general man come on <laughs> well ladies and gentlemen we are here today for a very spicy uh thesis which craig will be presenting and defending today it is going to be, well, you know what, Craig, why don't you give us your summary case? What What is this crazy argument here? You're, you're claiming someone invented the papacy, a specific librarian dude, a, a bookworm invented the papacy. What is your case here? Give us, give it to us in sum. I will say in summary that the inventor of the papacy is someone named Anastasius, the librarian. Almost no one's heard about him. But he's no librarian. He's the he's essentially like mob connected. It's probably a more accurate way of thinking of this guy. And it I am not a believer in the great man theory of history that you could usually point out a single individual that makes these massive macro historical changes. But there are a few of them. So like mm -hmm. Genghis Khan, for example. Yeah. You know? The Lord Jesus Christ, you know, though obviously he's God and man, but he he is human. Um, and I would include Anastasi's librarian. He is, from a macro historical perspective, one of the most important thinkers that ever lived. And it's just one of those ironies that people really don't know what he was about. Wow, that is a very tall claim, Craig. Can you explain to us how was he such a massive and influential figure? Well, really to unpack that would require giving a kind of very broad overview of history in the first millennium, which I could do. But to answer in one sentence is unlike what, let's say, trad apologists will tell you, um, papalism, meaning uh, for Vatican I papacy, second millennium papacy, post Hildebrandian reform papacy did not exist in the first millennium church. And so if it didn't exist, the question is, well, when did the ideas, the ingredients of it come up? And we're going to find they all originate from that literal pen of Anastasius Librarian within a window of time of about 20 years. Wow. So if your, if your theory here is correct, Craig, that's actually going to be a pretty fantastic comeback to, because I'll often, I'll very often hear, well, I'll hear it from authors as well, but from different issues. And that's, that's another one we can hash out. Um, but I'll also hear it from uh, Romanist apologists and laymen in discussion where they'll say, you guys can't point to a, a specific time when this papacy and that came out. What, how do you explain that if it wasn't true and apostolic? Well, if you're correct, we can. So that is really, really interesting. That's why I'm really fascinated with your thesis. Um, but really quickly before we do that, forgot to do this first thing. But a big, uh, where's the where's the thing? Application window. Paul needs money. 
I need the money, he boys. Needs money. Thank you, heaps, to my existing supporters. You guys are absolute legends, especially two people within a few days of each other who became supporters at the new highest tier of Apostolos. You guys are absolute legends. Thank you so much. Um, I will be fully uh, launching tutoring services in March, but uh, for those who are Apostolos tier, they can claim they can claim their set free hours. Well, Apostolos and the one below that, Protos and Isois, first among equals. They will be able to claim their free hours of tutoring right now. So it'll be more of a testing phase, but it's still something you can do right now. So that's a cool incentive. But nonetheless, all supporters, absolute legends, thank you so much. If you want to help me turn this into a proper livable income, go to my subscribe start in the description below. And I would like to announce the first time, uh, I, well, actually, I've announced before that uh, I am aiming for 30 supporters by March. So by the beginning of March, 30 subscribe star supporters. We are already at 19 so far, which is super cool. I believe we can do it. And as a special offer for only between now and the beginning of March, every new supporter, no matter what tier, if you come and become a supporter between now and March, you will get a free one hour private chat session, me and you, whatever you want to talk about. Just as a little incentive for people to become supporters between now and March at any level, whether it's all the way up to the Apostolos tier, or all the way at the bottom with Pistos tier, which still has some really cool benefits, by the way, since I updated them recently. And now people at even the lowest tiers will be able to participate in private supporter streams. And I'll be announcing the next one very soon, probably uh, coming up with a date after this stream. So thank you very much for my existing supporters. And I hope people who are considering supporting, as long as you're financially stable and you are supporting, whether monetarily or with your manpower, your local church, I will happily take your shekels if you are willing. So thank you very much to you guys. And now back to the discussion. Uh, well, if you there. get too many supporters, you won't have secret knowledge, right? You won't have your Gnostic following because there'll just be, it'll be the whole general public will be subscribers to the other Paul. On the contrary, I'll just keep making higher and higher tiers where I give them more ascended. Uh, oh, yeah, look at that. Look at that. You Big thought brain. ahead. Big brain. So Trust me, guys, eventually you'll get noticed. Eventually. Anyway, there you go. Craig, let's jump into the detail. So can you give us a, before we go into mad detail, can you give us an outline of the key evidences that you believe prove your thesis? Well, key evidences, which we'll get to, and they're going to need time to unpack. Yes. But the main things that Anastasius the Liberian did, which have totally changed history, have wholly, totally changed the bishopric of Rome, and that means the whole uh, history of the Second Millennium Church, is that he mainstreamed the pseudo Isidorian decretals. He falsified the minutes of Nicaea II and inserted papal prerogatives not found in the Greek. He made alterations to the formula of the Adrian II in the Latin. This is a confession that was made during the Council of Constantinople 870 with the same papal prerogatives. And the reason why these are relevant because they're not found in previous documents, not in an interpatriarchal context, meaning not where it would be disputes between Eastern and Western churches. He denied the full authority of the canons of Trullo on grounds other than economia. We'll get into why that's important, how this sort of changes the perspective of what exactly the role the Bishop of Rome is. And he devised the doctrine of papal infallibility. And no, St. Pope Agatho's letter in Constable 3, as I covered in History of Papacy, does not teach papal infallibility the formula Hermistus does not teach papal infallibility, but Anastasius the Librarian definitely does teach papal infallibility. And so we have everything there on that list when we go into detail, other than the issue of direct jurisdiction, which only came up during the Crusades. And so, as we could see, if it weren't for Anastasius the Librarian, the Crusades occurred, a lot of different things might have happened, which would have not created a parallel church, a, a schism, a whole new ecclesiology in the West. Um, Anastasius, as we're going to find, has a major has made major literary and political decisions, which have altered the perception of the papacy of the West. And the pen is mightier than the sword. So if you start changing the entire manuscript record, and it's undebatable it's not me making a conspiracy theory everyone agrees it's from through anastasia's librarian then yes you could have a lot of changes oofed 
oofed big claims if you want um when we go into detail with these evidences would you like me to pull up your blog post for like exact quotes or just as you are i you know i i sent you a file with the things i'm reading if you could if you follow along and want to share it uh, on screen you can just guys don't ask the other paul for it because a lot of these things though not all of them will be eventually in a book that i'm writing um, honestly, this this topic will be more exclusive to your channel because I'd prefer not to get into uh, too much speculation over textual criticism and manuscripts. The book will be a little more moderate. But as I'll detail in the end, I'm going to give the evidence. And mm. people could call me crazy. People could make ad hominems about me. But in the end of the day, the question is not what other different things they could bring up. The question is, what other interpretations could they give to the evidence? Because if there's no compelling interpretation to the evidence, then the ones that I'm giving, you pretty much have to concede that this is really what occurred. And I sound very calm right now because it's very humbling to like realize this is really how it happened. It's, mm. And I'm going to make that case for everyone tonight. Yeah, I can, you know, I can actually attest that phenomena where initially you're looking at a historical thing and and you have a thesis you really want to be true and it looks like you haven't gone full neck deep yet but it looks like the evidence is pointing your way so you get like really excited but then once you get super deep in and you really see it's it's not just you on a high like you really see wow the evidence really points that way it's suddenly it, it's almost paradoxical it kind of makes you go wow this is wow this is this is serious stuff because it's not just me being excited this is actually real things it's it's a weird phenomena but uh but it's a, it's a real one um and, so and yeah i think we're young enough where we'll see this published and it it will ultimately change i think the historiography of the era it's not going to happen tomorrow obviously but i think when the evidence is laid out uh, people are going to see that but i think we're hyping it almost unintentionally people might not know i'm sick right now which is another reason i'm calm but it's, I think it will help because people know nothing about the political context of 9th century Italy. Yeah. If I give some context, if I could take some time to do that, if that's okay. Yep, 100%. Let's get started. And so I just want to make clear to anyone that's really dived into all the ecumenical councils, read the letters of, uh, of popes, of saints in immense detail, it's clear to the mainstream scholars, and I have to say to myself, having done this dive into the sources, that the Vatican I papacy did not exist even in seed form in the early church. Uh, the early church demonstrably operated upon a consensus-based epistemology and ecclesiology. Now, what I mean the, about uh, consensus-based epistemology, in short, is something along the lines of, we all know X is the Christian teaching because everyone understands the scriptures as teaching X, right? So if we all agree the scriptures teach X, then we know it's true. Uh, it's not, that's the smartest thing I've ever heard about X is, no, we we all agree X is this, and so X is true. It's, I'm not even, you don't have to agree with this epistemology, but this is epistemology that existed in the early church for centuries. Now, not coincidentally, the ecclesiology of church was also consensus-based. And in short, it, consensus-based ecclesiology is whether a single ecumenical council, where theoretically you have everyone involved in this council, or you have the whole, church, whole world's local councils meeting on the same issue and forging an agreement, though not at the same time and same place, the church, as a result of this consensus, can decide disciplinary matters and define doctrine canonically. The keyword's canonically, because like, for example, uh, St. Augustine and others talk about if everyone in the church prays for the salvation of loved ones, is something that St. Augustine says, then we know for a fact that God could save loved ones through our prayers. Now, there's no canon about that. We don't need a canon about that to know that it's true, right? Um, but when we, talk, when we talk about well, what's, do what's a canonical dogma? What's something written in stone as dogma and that's canonical? Well, it's something that councils do. And when they all agree, that's how we know that it's legitimate and it's true. Now, again, you don't have to even agree with that sort of ecclesiology. The point is, it's the ecclesiology that we find in all the earlier sources of the church. Now, the papal paradigm, as people understand today, theoretically does not exclude the proceeding, right? They could say, yes, we agree that the faith is 
is what was held since antiquity everywhere by everyone, by all and all that stuff, you know. But it adds a third epistemic and ecclesiastical means of deciding doctrinal ecclesiastical matters, right? The Pope of Rome individually can define doctrine infallibly and arbitrate disciplinary doctrinal matters above councils. So the consensus-based epistemology, consensus-based ecclesiology is sort of like lower tiered. It could exist, but it's subjugated to the fact that uh, this theoretically um, indefectible, infallible Pope above whom no one could appeal, who doesn't require anyone's consent, could decide matters. Um, some people could say, well, you essentially, by virtue of that, forfeit those other epistemologies and ecclesiologies, and, and I would actually agree with that. But the point is, in theory, people say, well, that's not the case. Now, there are a plethora of sources, as I was alluding to, that explicitly delineate the consensus-based ecclesiastical and epistemological views in the early church in the first thousand years of church history. But there is no single source that does not originate from at least the ninth century during the time of Anastasius the Librarian, which explicitly communicates the papal view as we know today. Not one. All right. So before Anastasius, there are examples of a bishop of Rome, let's say, ascribing to himself local jurisdictional primacy or the right to give his consent alongside others. And Roman apologists repeatedly infer from sources speaking of local primacy, something like universal primacy. But again, they have nothing explicit that shows this. They don't have one explicit source of this. Likewise, they repeatedly portray inaccurately episodes surrounding, let's say, the councils of Ephesus or Chalcedon, where Rome gave non uh, took non-binding appeals. And they'll say, oh, look, well, Rome took an appeal. That means they could decide something over the church. But by the admission of Pope Celestine and then also the admission of Pope Leo, those appeals were non-binding. And if you read the minutes of the council, they treat the appeals as non-binding. And the council gives the actual judgment. In fact, in Ephesus, they literally say that they put into force the non, you know, the the appeal made to Celestine in that case. Pretty much it wasn't binding if they had to put it into force. And so that's an issue which shows that the papacy did not have this universal jurisdiction, this uh, papal supremacy. And additionally, repeatedly, the apologists will portray other episodes like the formula Hormistas or St. Agatha's letter as teaching a fallibility, where details surrounding these documents inveigh against this. Now, this is not the video about this. This is an introduction. Mm -hmm. So you could go see my videos about this. I got something like 16 hours on the history of the papacy Go check it out, and I'm literally going toe by toe with one of the best Roman Catholic apologists there are. And you could make your, you could see how I make my case with those episodes. Now, it's beyond any dispute that not one ecumenical decree or canon says anything about Roman primacy, not one. And this includes the Sardican canons, which were interpreted by both Pope Leo the Great and Theodoret as applying to Rome's role in an ecumenical council, not Rome's role above a council or Rome's exclusive role. It'd just be Rome's function within an ecumenical conciliar mind, uh, context. Now, so being that we see all these things we've been told that supposedly are seeds of Vatican I or consistent Vatican I simply don't exist until the ninth century, the question then becomes, why do they start existing in the ninth century. Why is this all changed during the lifetime of Anastasius the Librarian? Well, in short, beginning in the mid eighth century, Rome became a middling feudal power, literally in the middle of Italy. So it's fitting, middle power, middle of Italy, right? And before that, they were the subjugated province, part of the Byzantine Empire. They were Surrounded by the Lombards to the south, the Franks to the north, Byzantines by sea, which could always raid Rome because it's uh, essentially reachable by, uh, by the ocean uh, or the Mediterranean Sea, rather. And so all three of these powers regularly made concessions to Rome in the form of military protection in exchange for Rome's constantly shifting alliances. In fact, when the Byzantines had lost power in Italy in the mid-8th century, Rome still claimed to be part of the Byzantine Empire. People go, well, why would they do that? Because the whole idea was 
They can't make us do anything anyway. So if we pretend to be Byzantine and someone tries to take us over, they cause a war not only with us, but also with the Byzantine Empire. And I point this out so people kind of realize these are geopolitical considerations that Rome uses their influence as this middling power in order to get some patrimony in Italy. You know, some they even get the city of Ravenna out of this. They call these donations, like the donation of Pepin, uh, people have heard the donation of Constantine, which is a forgery. But Rome actually starts getting land, like a country that belongs to them. And they do this by exchanging influence for military protection. Now, Rome's goal was not like, I don't say this to make them sound horrible. Their goal was to maintain independence and not be swallowed up by any one of these powers, as had occurred during the Byzantine papacy. And during the Byzantine papacy, um, three separate popes, and I can name the top of my head, uh, uh, Silverius, Vigilius, and Martin were tortured, <laughs> right? Like they kidnapped them and tortured them. So like you could kind of see like, oh, we want to not have that happen again. It's pretty understandable. But ultimately, this sort of like Game of Thrones politicking led to the Franks outclassing everyone. And the Franks uh, classed everyone and eventually forced Rome to change how they elected the Pope so that they can manipulate the papal selection process, essentially turning the Pope into a Frankish puppet. Now, time passes in the ninth century and the Franks start fragmenting, right? They get, there's more heirs to the thrones, not just Charlemagne, his sons and grandsons and whatnot. Um, the empire splits between them and Rome begins to exert independence again. Now, the last Frankish emperor to exact considerable control over Rome itself until the resurgent Holy Roman Empire about 100 years later, we're going to find is Louis II. Now, Louis II's dominion essentially was Italy, all right? Like, he had a little bit beyond Italy. But he ruled from 844 to 875, as we're going to see pretty much the career of Anastasius Liberian. His main enemies were the Arabs and the Byzantines. Rome was to be kept pliant. So that way he doesn't get pretty much outmaneuvered by all these hostile powers that he's surrounded by. Now, Anastasius Librarian himself was Pope. He was made Pope by Louis II in the year 855. Of course, people have this sort of papal-centric view of history and they go, well, he never really was Pope. He was anti-Pope. But at that time, the Pope of Rome needed the Louis II's um, acceptance in order to be a pope. They needed the king to sign off and to ratify the election. It wasn't ratified. And Anastasius had a sham election and actually by Frankish force of arms was made pope. A Roman rebellion kicked him out as pope. But due to the Franks overcoming the rebellion, Anastasius was allowed back into Rome. But he took the kind of function, later officially librarian, but really the ghost writer for the next pope, Nicholas I in 858. And uh, Nicholas I was installed with Frankish support. So what we see was the court of sort of compromise between the Roman, what's it called, nobility and the Franks, which wanted to control Rome, where Anastasius was brought in to control Rome's foreign policy. And of course, the papacy at this time was intrinsic to a Roman foreign policy. And Nicholas was in control of domestic policy. And, and so the idea was to make everyone happy, this sort of compromise. Foreign policy was to be suited to meet Louis II's needs because he didn't want to be outmaneuvered in the Italian peninsula. So in effect, Anastasius, to, to make it simple to your audience, he was the Dick Cheney of the papacy, right? If people remember <laughs> President George W. Bush, he really didn't run things. Dick Cheney really ran things. Dick Cheney chose who he went to war with. And how a burden would be Louis II, right? So, so you kind of so you kind of hear you had kind of like the local pope and the foreign pope, essentially. Now they would always, of course, address Nicholas as pope. I don't want people to get the wrong idea, yeah. but as we're going to see, like Anastasius decides everything that happens. Anastasius writes all foreign correspondence, right? Anastasius is the one who dis, you know who maneuvers Roman foreign policy at the behest of Louis II. All right, and Adrian, this this is so extreme. Pope Adrian II, the next pope, had his family murdered by Anastasius. Absolutely livid. I think it was his kid and his wife, because popes had wives. They just, when they became bishop, they would, you know, their wife would go to a convent or whatever. Um, right? Murders his family. So, of course, he kicks him out of Rome, because that usually make you pretty angry. 
sort of murders her family. But I think a good indication of how things really ran was guess who comes back within a matter of months? Anastasi, the librarian. And who does he work for? Adrian II, and he gets and he gets given the promotion to the official librarian, and he gets to continue ghostwriting for Adrian II and deciding everything mm-hmm. Adrian II has to do. So clearly, Adrian II was a puppet who had no choice, and the Franks imposed Anastasius upon him. It's just a fact. It's interesting. This doesn't get observed more often, um, but it's just like. Why else would he let the murder of his family back in? He had no choice, obviously. Yeah. Now, Louis II's hold in Italy continually gets weaker. And the Arabs were threatening Rome. They had raiding parties. They were um, they were getting between these Roman client states, which were like kind of these quasi-Lombard feudal manners and stuff like that. And Byzantine power was increasing. Um, the Byzantines were starting to reconquer southern Italy. And after Louis II's death, Frankish power only continued to decline even more. In 879, Romans, Rome's foreign policy now pivoted from pro-Frank to pro-Byzantine because the Franks couldn't protect Rome from Arab raiders. And so in this exchange, they conceded Roman jurisdiction in southern Italy where the Byzantines reconquered. And this is in accordance to the canons where the Byzantines, uh, it's a canon 17 of Chalcedon, I forget which one, in Trullo, it's in the 30s. But when, uh, a, when a city is reconquered by the Roman Empire, the ecclesiastical um, jurisdictions could, be, could follow the civil model, is what both canons say. And so Rome says, okay, we concede, you can now have southern Italy, you're there, just help protect us from Arab raiders. They did not concede jurisdiction in Bulgaria as Byzantium did not conquer this territory and it was historically Roman. That doesn't mean that uh, Constantinople, the you know, conceded that to Rome. But be that as it may, that was a deal. It wasn't over the Balkans. It was over southern Italy. And uncoincidentally, Anastasius loses his job, right? As soon as the Franks don't call the shots, Anastasius is fired. They undo his work. The Council of Constantinople late 79880 is held. Reproachment with Constantinople is, uh, is done. And Anastasius fades into obscurity after that. Wow. So that... That is the context of Anastasius' career, and this will make when we start unpacking the main, the actual things that he did to invent the papacy, mm-hmm. it will make sense why he did it because he didn't do it for yeah. some random reason, and it couldn't occur yeah. under any other circumstance. Before I I keep going, if you have any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, and uh, not really many questions so far. It seems like a good and uh, good, nice and clear presentation of uh, of what's happening here. Um, there was something I wanted to. There was something I wanted to comment. Um, well, I guess ba- I guess basically someone should make a movie about this. I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you could make an HBO show about Anastasius and legitimately yeah. be good. They should cast the actor. That's your thumbnail, right? Yeah, he, just, yeah. he looks like the dude. You know, it's. Uh, he, this really is as real as it gets in history. Mm. Uh, as it's 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 really interesting, and I think I'll make. Here's an opinion. The stuff is going to be more evidence based, but here's my gut opinion. I think hi- historians have not pushed this sooner, simply because uh, historians love guys that make manuscripts available to them. And Anastasius, if you read the manuscripts, he bequeaths. He writes like a scholar. He has footnotes. He makes critical notes about languages. He makes critical notes about other manuscripts. And so it's easy to kind of almost fall in love with the writing of Anastasius from a historian's viewpoint. Like it's not poetic or anything, Mm -hmm. but he writes like a historian. And so it kind of gives him a faux credibility, which is by no means justifiable. I won't give their names, but they're actually... Literally the two top scholars in this topic. And if you knew this topic, you know who their names are. And in my own private correspondence with them, and we've gone back and forth, they they think Anastasius is a lying bastard. Um <laughs> I'm gonna go I'm gonna go farther and actually connect the dots as to what this lying bastard actually came up with. Um, but it's but that's why I think historians haven't pounced on this sooner. It's because as what he's provided historians is so useful. It's almost uh, 
it's almost hurtful. It's like finding out there's no Santa Claus. Yeah. When you realize, oh, he pretty much falsified all this stuff. And so really the historical work I need to be doing is unpacking the lies he inserted, not yeah. trusting all these really highly technical documents he put mm-hmm. together. And this will make more sense when we talk about the pseudo is adoring the yeah. So as you said, this isn't really a big topic that's been treated too too much by scholarship. Not that scholarship hasn't written about Anastasius and what he's done. Yeah, or yeah. I mean, you, mm-hmm. it's not like you like personally walked into the libraries in Italy to find this stuff. There's stuff that no. existed, but just in this way of connecting the dots with ecclesiastical policy with geopolitical realities, this is something you haven't seen really dealt with much at all in the scholarship. I, I, I would say what is lacking is the broader focus that my work brings hmm. because people will be experts in 9th century or 8th century or particularly diplomatic correspondence between the 8th and 9th century. But what they're not looking at is, for example, the history of the entire papacy institution. Hmm. Yeah. Right? And so I could cite Dr. Ev- excuse me, Evangelist Christos. And he'll just make the passing comment, everything that Anastasius wrote for Pope Nicholas, he says, was unprecedented. He uses the word several times in, in the article Imperium and Sacerdotum. And so his, essentially his conclusion he draws is the same as mine, but he doesn't connect the dots. He just sees where the dots end. Uh, mm. The same thing with Federico Montanaro, who wrote the introduction that people know now from... Uh, the Council Council of Late 6 and 870, he collaborated with Father Richard Price. And if you read his his scholarly notes, if you read what he writes, he likewise says all the stuff that's come to this council has absolutely no canonical precedent. And so they see where the dots end. But unless you have done the work of the go to all the previous centuries, you don't connect the dots leading to those ending dots, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. We do have one very important question. Did Anastasius patent the Pope invention? Well, the answer would be no. <laughs> because the way he presented it was that it was always that way. And as we're going to find out, he did so pretty crassly by misrepresenting sources and misrepresent, you know, misrepresenting what they said. You could even say forging it and outright forging sources. So... Mm. Um, and he did so in a very minutely, uh, in a minute manner and subtle matter, similar to the pseudo Isidorian decretals. Understood. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to kind of dis- dispute you there because if you look really closely at some old stock footage and photos of, uh, of old popes from when they had the papal tiara, if you zoom in really close, you can actually see a little inscription that says copyright Anastasius 870 AD. Fun fact. Uh, I, I guess I haven't seen the archeo- how the archaeology uh, weighs in on the question. Good up your game, Craig. Good up your game, brah. All right. <laughs> now, let's outline the key, the key evidences and sources that you appeal to for this case. What, are, what is the list of these things? And then we can go into detail. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll give the list again, which is... I hope I put it in the bottom, or where do I put this list? Because it's going to be annoying to read it again. You put, you put it right at the end of your summary. Here we go. Here is that list. The um, he Actually, mainstream I'll share it now if you want for people's convenience. Ah, uh, I'll just say it real fast. The the okay. mainstream he mainstreamed the pseudo is adoring decretals. He falsified the minutes in ICA two to insert papal prerogatives not found in the Greek. He made alterations to the formula of Adrian the second in the Latin with the same papal prerogatives. He denied the full authority of the canons of Trullo on grounds other than economia, as I yeah. as I alluded to before. This will have major ramifications to the papacy. And papal, he invented papal infallibility. So mm. pretty big things. Fascinating. Pretty big, big things. fascinating. Really quickly before we continue, <laughs> can you define economia for non-people who don't really know yes. much? It, economia simply means discretion, right? The bishop has a discretion how exactingly to apply the canon. So, for example, if a cop pulls you over and you're going one mile per hour to the speed limit, he has the right to give you a ticket legally, but he has the discretion not to. And so that means the laws on the books, if a cop refuses to give you a ticket because he gave you a, a second chance, that doesn't mean the law disappears. It just shows that the yep. those who can enforce the law have discretion. So I think it helps a lot just to think of economy as not some magic wand. It just means the bishop has discretion mm-hmm. in how to apply it. And the last canon of Truro literally says that. It, it compares yeah. the bishop to a doctor who chooses what sort of medicine and how much. 
Yeah. So what you're claiming is with that specific one that not that Anastasia said, well, these canons don't fully apply now because X, Y, and Z, but rather they don't have a full authority, period. That's what you're claiming. Well, yeah. Well, what we're going to find is what Anastasia says. It's not that we in our own judgment will use discretion and not apply the full force of this canon. Mm. He'll say the papal decree contradicts the canon and that invalidates the canon. And that's a very mm. different theory. Yeah. Very different theory than Okanomiya. Okay, okay, that's some big stuff. Let's jump right into it, and we'll start with the mainstreaming of the pseudo Isidorian decretals. If and if you can as well, a basic summary for those who don't know what the pseudo Isidorian decretals are. The pseudo the pseudo Isidorian decretals are a massive collection. I think it's three hundred thousand words in Latin. It might be twice that. Right? I'm going to settle on three hundred thousand. It's very long. Um, it's it would be almost like fourteen hundred pages or so of documents of councils of of papal letters of fake papal letters of real letters with fake things thrown in uh and they're not really they don't read ridiculous in isolation it's just ridiculous and too convenient it's all in one spot right mm. um and so the decretals tricked people uh because they weren't just really stupid they were in your face, ridiculous in a sense, but they, they weren't written in a very stupid way. They were profound and they were subtle, uh, but they were not the first in your face, ridiculous forgery uh, in the history of the Roman church. The donation of Constantine was a forgery made in the 750s, but it was a tame document, you know, ecclesiastically speaking, because its purpose was to justify Rome's political existence as an independent entity. That's why that introduction I gave where I said that Rome became its own country and had to play off the Lombards and the Franks and whomever mm. against each other. Well, that's where that's the context which the donation of Constantine comes up from, right? It, it Constantine gives Rome the right to be a country, and right, you kind of need that to be a country, right? You need the right to exist. Now there are limited ecclesiastical claims in the donation of Constantine, um, and the claim pretty much is that Rome has the right to hear appeals to quote the. The donation um, from the, from the churches of God in the whole world, but that's not really a crazy claim. That's something that Rome has been doing since the third century, started with Paul Samosata. Um, and just so people know, there were appeals from Rome to other churches. So appeals from the churches of God, the whole world, either against Rome or to Rome, has been something that's existed throughout church history. And so it really is not an audacious claim compared to Constantine has given your palace in Rome authority over all the palaces in the world, you know, and then talk about secular power. That's obviously far more audacious and important yeah. politically for Rome's purposes at that juncture. Mm. Now, Pope Adrian I, who was pope during the Council of Nicaea II in the 8th century, he quoted this forgery in a local context, it's but they never Sidorian. had the... That is. I'm sorry? He quoted the pseudo Isidorian forgeries or Constantine? No, 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 or, the uh, donation of Constantine. Got it, got it. So the reason I say this show is like popes weren't, you know, above quoting forgeries, right? Mm. You know, it would have been written in his lifetime. So he probably knew it was a forgery, but it didn't stop him from quoting it. Um, so that being said, what we don't see, though, is the donation of Constantine used and quoted overseas to the Greeks, right? It's, it's this kind of bizarre Latin document for a Latin political context and doesn't really go anywhere. Now, the pseudo Isidorian decretals start in a very similar way. They originate in Reims, France. They actually were penned in the literal monastery where Pascinus, uh, uh, Pas Pascasius, and pronounce his wrong, name wrong, Robertus, the inventor of the Immaculate Conception, was abbot. In fact, the mainstream view is he actually wrote the pseudo Isidorian decretals, by the way. The most recent scholarship says, well, we're not proof that he personally wrote them, but we actually know for a fact because they actually put down in the decretals, we have three 9th century manuscripts, which cite the exact books in the library of his monastery that they were using and they were modifying texts from. So it's one of those weird connections of history where the, the guy who invented one heresy was part of inventing another heresy. And it's, <laughs> not, it's not me making this up. It's not some sort of crazy thing an apologist says because it sounds outlandish this is mainstream scholarship so you know go read scholars it. guys and the scholars you know it, it's uh a lot of what i know from the pseudo Isidorians, because i'm not reading 300 000 pages of latin 
uh, the words in Latin is uh, from Knibbs, uh, his article, Ebo, Sudo Isidore, and the Date of the False Decretals. And he writes how um, the Sudo Isidorians exaggerated papal authority and sidelines royal authority. All right, so that was their point. The, for some reason, guys in Radbertus's monastery wanted to exaggerate papal authority in order to sideline royal authority. To quote uh, uh, Nibs, he says, particularly in the arena of procedural law, so that the Frankish Episcopate would have de facto immunity always and everywhere. All right. So in other words, the Pope is not nearby in France, but you got to worry about the, the, the Frankish king. So you make all these rules that supposedly the Frankish king can't do anything. You know, the Pope must have final say, and you'll never get the Pope's final say because he's far away, or there's a different Frankish king there, which you, the Frankish king locally doesn't get along with. And so that lets you just pretty much run wild and no one can stop you. Right. So that that was the actual like. So the guys who wrote the pseudo Isidorians weren't writing it because they're like, we love the papacy. Right. Or the po the papacy is something we believe in, but we don't have the resources. So we're just going to invent them because it's something we already believe. No, that's that's not why the pseudo Isidorians were made. They, they were made so that French ecclesiastics could insulate themselves from meddling from their local uh, lords and kings. All right. Now. I think uh, I'm trying to remember some of the contents in the Pseudo-Isidorians will become useful for our purposes. So, for example, there's a forged decree from Pope uh, Mel Melchiades, which to uh, quote Knibs is page 156, the other page is 155, that required papal approval for the deposition to bishops. So think about this. The Franks want to depose bishops, right? The king says, you're gone. And they just want the local... The local synod, which they, you know, by the point of the sword, they can manipulate to say, all right, you're gone. But mm -hmm. now, no, you need the Pope's approval. Oh, the other Frankish king that's not the local Frankish king has power over that Pope and he'll never agree to it. So what's that mean if you're the French bishop? That no one's going to depose you, right? It's like an insurance policy. Now, let me give an example so people can kind of see how it works. There was a bishop named Ebo. He's a bishop in Reims. It's in central slash Western, the central slash Western French part of the Carolingian Empire. And he appealed to Lothair. Now, Lothair was the Carolingian king of then Eastern France and Northern Italy, right? And Pope Sergius, because, right, you had to appeal to Lothair because he's the king that had control over Pope Sergius to reinstate him because Charles the Bald, the Carolingian ruler of the part of France Ebo was from, deposed him, right? We could already see the kind of tangential things going on here. Now, ironically, Sergius, the Pope, did not help him in this episode, probably because Charles the Bald's military position was unassailable, right? It's the lawfare wasn't going to start a war over this, and so um, he wasn't bailed out. But that didn't stop Ebo from trying. Most mainstream scholarship sees that the Pseudo-Zadorians continued evolving because the political situation continued evolving. Ebo was then translated from Reims, which is again in France, to Hildensheim, which is in Germany, using a forged recommendation letter from Gregory the Fourth. Right, where usually guys that deal with forgeries don't exactly have scruples about making other forgeries, and we can read that in the same article, pages one seventy one to one seventy two. Now, the forgeries gave the Pope, not synods, final say over translations. Translations mm -hmm. meaning the change from one see to another, which was very rare in the ninth century. So mm -hmm. it was the point of this was to make it easy for forgeries to be used to justify the translations. You see? Because mm -hmm. when by the time you get to the Pope, you might not be able to get to him or he might die, or then you could say, Oh, the letter he sent was forged and my letter is true, right? It's it's just all playing yeah, a big and then game. The Pope can just say, Oh, see you later. Yoink. <laughs> In reality, what the Pope's going to say, what's it worth it to you for me to go along with this? Mm. Right? Mm. What's it worth it to you? Oh, um, mm. our pilgrims are going to are gonna give alms in Rome. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to impede them. Right? So it's, it's kind of like protection racket a little bit. But th <laughs> this is how it works, you know. So anyway, um, the Carolingians proved adept at using these forgeries selectively. Right, because they would defy the Pope when it suited them. Right, so they make these forgeries about how like the Pope is the second coming. Right, <laughs> but then when it suited them, they're like, nah, because it never was about the Pope. 
<laughs> it was about insulating themselves from from domestic political issues. Mm. Now, Anastasia's a librarian, again, if my case is correct, and he's one of the most important people to ever walk the earth, yeah. it's he's a little smarter than that, right? Mm. He responded to these challenges and he used the several the pseudo Isadorian decretals and other documents from the papal archives, including Greek ones, which he would translate because he wanted as much ammo as possible. Um in response to the Franks. Now, you can read about this in an article um, from Sonmar, Hinkmar of Rames, and the Canon Law of Episcopal Translation, pages 439 to 440. Now, Anastasius, right, he not only played the domestic game like we talked about, the sort of back and forth, and you had to give favors or the, the Pope would hold out on you. And at, by the time Anastasius is there, right, he decides what the Pope will do, right? So that's why he's he personally gets involved in these disputes. Now, Anastasius not only does that with the Franks, he now has the gall to quote these letters through Pope Nicholas, because he wrote the letters for Pope Nicholas, to St. Photius and the Byzantine emperors 40 times. Now, there's a whole article about this, Fry Chrysos, Imperium, and Sacerdotium. But the point is, he did this because he wanted to insulate Nicholas from deposition, which actually occurred in 867. People don't talk about this, but the Pope was deposed in 867. There was actually a pan-Orthodox council to depose the Pope. And um, a thousand people signed on to it, actually. Um, and our source for that is Anastasius himself, interesting. He says, oh, it's all forgeries, of course. But that's a pretty big number of bishops to sign on to uh, deposing the Pope, which certainly occurred with Nicholas. And so he quotes these um, these sort of is adoring decretals because it gives Rome unilateral power to approve of Ignatius of Constantinople's deposition. Um, and if they don't unilaterally, unilaterally approve it, right? Remember, you need Rome's approval to approve all depositions in France. Well, if you apply that to Constantinople, now the local Byzantine synod can't take care of their in-house business. Now, in reality, I actually think Rome canonically has the right to consent to the deposition of Patriarch and to hold out that consent. They didn't have to quote the pseudo Isidorian decree to do it, but you sort of have to when they might depose you, right? So Anastasius also wrote asserting that Roman prerogatives cannot be modified by conciliar action being grant and saying that these prerogatives are granted solely by Christ irrespective to synodical consent. And that's, a, that's we could see in Christo's article, page 326, 327, this is totally unprecedented because, in effect, this twisting the pseudo as adoring decretals, which was an intra-patriarchal document, which was never intended to actually help Rome, this twisting into that, those documents to an unprecedented inter-patriarchal assertion of power was wholly novel, and Anastasius was responsible. It's just historical fact. No one else it was him. All right, not me making up. Right, you can read Christos if you want more on it, and he, he's quoted all over the place in this era because he's pretty much the living authority. Um, now, the motivation, I believe, that's my opinion, is like, well, why would Rome be so forceful about this? They were trying to exact concessions in Bulgaria, and they were trying to insulate Rome because, like I alluded to before, they actually had a pope deposed. Right, and you could read about that page eighty-seven and prices Constantinople eight sixty-nine eight seventy. And so there it is. The pseudo is adoring the creedles. They're mainlined by the way they are used essentially changes history. So like the Chinese could invent gunpowder, but in someone, until someone figures out to put the gunpowder in a cannon and have it, you know, blow down a wall to a walled city, it doesn't really change history yet. Right. Mm. And so very much it's the person that uses the weapon a certain way. That is very, very important historically. And we know who that person is, Anastasius. <laughs> Now that, that is fascinating. That's big, big and fascinating. I'll give my first thing of devil's advocate. Might be a bit pop tier, might be worth engaging. But uh, the first thing I would I would think instinctively from a Romanist watching would be, well, you're, you're basing a lot of this case. So let's say Anastasius, whatever he did, bad stuff, cool. But it seems like a lot of your case is based on simply arguments from silence. This doesn't prove that just because we don't have an explicit thing um, expressing papal prerogatives uh, before Anastasius doesn't mean it wasn't believed. And one could say that the fact that the Western Church came to quickly adopt it, wouldn't that prove that this was an implicit consensus? How would you respond to that? My response would be that all I'm arguing is that 
the explicit beginning is Anastas is Anastasius. Mm-hmm. We know for a fact that the first time it comes up in an interpatriarchal context is with Anastasius. Mm-hmm. We have some faint rumblings from other forgeries of the past. I think actually only one. It's only one, and it's quoted in the Caroline books. We'll get into it. Um, but it's always in an interpatriarchal context, like the pseudo Isidorian. So really, it just would have been an inside joke if it never debuted in the world stage. And we know who made it debut in the world stage, Anastasius. Mm. That's, beyond, that's beyond contention. Everyone admits yeah. this. So basically, um, you don't it, uh, explicit things from before is uh, explicit denials from before. Not really relevant. We can point to how, hey, here's this guy. He first does it. He changes things around him basic issue of cause and effect there wasn't a thing before now there is and so to kind to try and do a cope thing of like oh it could have existed without any evidence that's kind of seems like a cope would you agree with that it's it's ad hoc essentially it's just they just digging the explanation yeah. it's not historically yeah. respectable in any way but the soon as the dorians they originate in the 840s all right mm. um anastasius his serious career he was kicking around beforehand for all we know he was hanging out in that part of france though i personally don't think so i even though he he's ethnically a frank i believe he was a frank that lived in italy because his uncle was a bishop in italy but they had frankish names so they weren't italians or greeks for that matter he learns greek but he is learning a foreign language not because he was an italian greek which there are plenty of um but that being said his career is immediately after when these uh decretals become mainlined and so being that he's a librarian and has all sorts of documents and has access to Roman archives, he obviously knew they were fake. But mm. he made lemon he made lemonade out of he made lemonade out of the lemon peels that the Fra, uh, the Frankish bishops trying to give him and he outmaneuvered him because he's he was smart enough. There you go, there you go. And even then, I give I did even add to your answer saying you you yourself um, uh, have noted in a lot of your content, blog and video wise. Uh, situations, past situations in the first millennium where no, these paper prerogatives were in fact uh, violated. So I simply, uh, uh, at least as promulgated by Anastasius and that paper infallibility, no concept of that. Um, I'm making the doco for Craig Trulia right now, and that'll be coming out very soon where a lot of that thing will be given in one big convenient spot. Um, so yeah, so it's not it's not merely a silence either. There isn't there isn't a silence on this. I, I'd even personally point to the Easter controversy as a very as a very clear demonstration. As that. I alluded to in the introduction, it's we have explicit and mm. tons from popes explicit evidence of consensus based epistemology and ecclesiology. Yeah. We have no explicit papalist source. Period. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it's like need. as a historian, I just got I have to go with where the evidence is. Yeah. That that's what it comes exactly, down to. Yeah. There was not, there was A for a while and no B. And then suddenly there was B and A started to be repressed a bit. I mean, come on, come on. Catechumen, my man, good to see you. He asks, is this work publicly available? Uh, I would work available publicly. I'd love to read it. Yes, on the other Paul's, <laughs> the other Paul's YouTube channel. And you can click transcript. Like I said, there will be a book on this topic. It's going to be called Rise and Fall of the Papacy. And, right. um, I'm making significant headway, so I'm not going to say it's going to be published this year, but if God grants me health, it will be done this year. And um, so there will be a book with all this research, and it will have all the primary sources. And uh, I, interestingly enough, be, the ninth century, there's less primary sources, so you'll notice I'll have to quote more secondary sources. Mm. Um, but most of the book will be um, intense coverage of the primary sources. Excellent, excellent. And your book, can't wait for that to come out. I actually have like outlines and even written bits of like a major papacy book project myself, which is very, very long term. But I think your book will probably be a great stepping stone for my own as well. From you, well, project. you actually have seen uh, some of the rough drafts of my book, so you That's you it. know that That's it's it. you know that it's happening. It's, it's very happening. juicy stuff. And uh, probably the one bit I cringe at is your little pet theories on the Easter controversy. But we can we can discuss it another time. <laughs> we did a stream oh, on that. No, I, watch. Oh, yeah, yeah, there is. We'll leave that aside for now. <laughs> for now I don't think now. they're theories, actually. I think it's, it's, I, I bring up several sources which actually correspond oh, with it's what I'm saying. It's not a theory, it's a fact. It's not a fact. It's a, it's a fact. <laughs> All right. What is the next evidence, um, next major evidence on the misdoings, the misdeeds of Anastasius Corleone? Well, it's, he falsified the minutes in Nicaea too, and insert papal prerogatives not found in the mm. Greek. I think that's a pretty big thing. I mean, the whole Latin tradition. That exists only comes from Anastasius. 
And how many times have we heard Eric Yabara or Mike Lofton jump up and down and say, but Nicaea too says this, what do you have to say? <laughs> but who wrote it? And now we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. Now, the recent textual critical theories of uh, Dr. Lambers, and I'm convinced I'm the only talking head on the internet that's actually read his critical edition uh, for the letters at issue um, of the Greek Minutes in Nicaea 2. His theories, I went through multiple revisions, and I don't have the time. I have a 15,000-word article. People want to read it. I don't have the time to go every facet of the thesis, but usually when you have, it's like the Q theory. Oh, there's a Q1, a Q2, a Q3. When people have the old multiple layers of revisions, it's because the whole idea it's revised doesn't make a lot of sense, right? right. You got to start adding additional layers in order to even start trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Now, the mainstream scholarly view, which means the majority of scholars, maintains that the Greek was what was read during the council and the Latin was original to Rome, right? Mm -hmm. So... If you want to take this view and not that Anastasia's made up the Latin portions, that's the mainstream view. I'm going to purposely give a contrarian view. If, if Dr. Lambers gets to give a contrarian view, then I get to too. Now, in short, the Latin passage in Nicaea 2 speaks of uh, Rome being um, from St. Peter, and that makes him super duper special, right? The letter is called by the scholars je2448 so if i slip and start calling by letters and numbers you'll know what i'm talking about it's it's the letter to the roman emperors in nicaea 2. now the same greek letter lacks any specialness like it it inscribes uh it describes the rome and the churches of the world a common origin in the saints peter and paul all right mm -hmm. so uh that would be unexceptional but the latin says something exceptional now, at first glance, I would say you could read it at first glance and not find this totally outrageous, in all honesty. You know, the Latin letter quotes Matthew 6 and 18. And yes, it could apply to Rome. Even St. Cyprian applied it Matthew 6 and 18 to Rome. And we all know St. Cyprian's ecclesiology wasn't kowtowing to Rome. So it's just because someone quotes Matthew 6 and 18, that doesn't mean ipso yeah. facto uh, Vatican I, right? Now... The Pope Rome also in the early church had pastoral oversight. For example, Chalcedon calls Pope Leo Archbishop of the world. So any, you know, a document that says the same thing wouldn't be outrageous just for that detail. Also, Rome has the right to confirm each synod, as the Latin version of this letter says. But so does session six of Nicaea too admit this, right? So... Mm -hmm. That's not very outrageous. Everyone's got to consent to an ecumenical council canonically. So that's that's not really outrageous. But let's consider the differences in the Latin and the Greek, and then I'll get into the subtle things like the pseudoids are during the creedals that are inserted into the Latin, which I think um, prove forgery. Now, why does the Greek make mention of Saints Peter or Paul with no mention of the keys, right? Why does it do that? Why is it ascribed, the quote of the Greek letter, the foundation of the Catholic and Orthodox faith to all who exceed, succeed to their thrones, that's Peter and Paul, and not just to Rome, right? Very different emphasis. Why is it lack the end of the letter, which in the Latin version, in the ending, um, mentions Rome's executive role and demands jurisdiction in the Balkans? Why is that lacking in the Greek? Hmm. Now, a political tampering does make sense, right? You know, the Greeks never were going to concede these things to the Latins, so the Latins just dumped it. No, no doubt about it. But one must recognize that the Latin changes to JE2448, the, this letter to the emperors, are bizarre because it actually contradicts the point of the passage, right? This is where, like, all right, if, it was, if the passage was cogent, then I could say, all right, a political change makes sense, and that's the mainstream view but if you actually read what the whole point is with is that it cites saints peter and paul so the whole church gets these things from saints peter and paul and saints peter and paul appeared to constantine and told them to go to the pope and venerate an icon right this being that this is nicaea too that's obviously the point of the passage so the latin version where it modifies it where it's just about saint peter and not about peter and paul actually makes the passage make no sense so if it doesn't make any sense, that kind of implies, well, maybe it was tampered with. And as a result of that tampering, it ruins its original point. Now, I also want to make a point because I want to quibble with Dr. Lambers. 
is that Dr. Lambert's claims that the longer ending of this letter is quoted in the Caroline books, which are an anti Nicaea II collection of arguments um, that are made against Pope Adrian. And the Caroline books are, uh, they're from the late eighth century. So if what Dr. Lambert's is true, this would prove at least some part of the conclusion is of that letter in the Latin really existed in the late eighth, eighth century. And that adds credibility that political changes occurred. However, if you actually read the footnotes of his critical edition, which of course the Roman apologists aren't doing. If you actually read the footnotes, the one citation to the Caroline books is strictly to the title of the Frankish emperor. And not for nothing, that's not specific enough, you know, being that it's not quoting, it's not say, well, in, you know, um, the Caroline book, it said exactly this. It just used the same title for the emperor. And so it could be purely coincidence that two contemporary sources ascribe the title, uh, the same title to the emperor. It's like two different sources calling the pope the pope. Calling him by the, I mean, he's just Bishop of Rome, but if two sources call him by the title Pope of Rome, that doesn't mean that one was quoting the other, right? It's just a common yep. title. So it's kind of like this textual critical stretch by Dr. Lambers. And because almost no one reads this stuff, people just accept it. Mm. But I just have to say, I don't accept it. I don't think that's very convincing. Yeah. Read the footnotes, yeah. people. Read the Don footnotes. Yeah. Very important stuff happens in there. I, if you're going to do actual history, anyone could be a talking head and, pe and take people's money on the internet and, and talk with a silver tongue. It, it takes a different set of abilities and and time and research to actually understand historical documents. you got to do the work yeah. of historian. It's just the That's reality. It. That's it. Um, so that being said... I think that all this evidence applies to Latin alteration. It's not the original because we simply have no no existence until um, until Anastasi's translation of the longer ending. The passage doesn't make sense, and believe it or not, the whole debate over there was a debate over forgeries in the letters in the eight sixties. It wasn't about this letter. It was about another letter. So you would think. If there was actual discussions of jurisdiction, the Balkans, which were under consideration in the debate of the other letter in the 860s, if there was actual debate over uh, the papacy, which there actually wasn't in the 860s, then you think both letters would have came up in conversation because the longer ending to JE2448, the letter to the emperors, actually is much more specific about jurisdiction in the Balkans than the debated letter of JE2449, which is the letter to Tiresias, which is also quoted in Nicaea too. And so if the Latin version existed and had these claims to the Balkans, why didn't Anastasius writing for Nicholas um, write to Photius and say, haven't you read the letter to the emperors? It flat out says this. He didn't write it because the forgery didn't exist yet. Mm. That was actually right. going to be my main devil's advocate question, asking, well, how do you know the Latin's a forgery and not the Greek guys taking it out? But I guess you kind of answered that. There's some critical, very critical silences in the historical record. Well, beyond that, Anastasius himself claims that the Greek's not forged. I mean, right? So the whole textual critical theory that Anastasius' version is the only correct theory of Lambers is actually contradicted by the person who he gets his text from. Um, Anastasius claims he makes the political argument. He claims mm. that the we had our version, the Greeks had their version, and we agreed to alter it to make peace with the Greeks, right? And so that's actually the mainstream view. That's the view that Anastasius presents. But of course he'd present that if he added additional forgeries. And so that's why I, I, I demand the question to be answered. Why would Anastasius make very specific allegations to alterations in JE2449 where there's same where those same differences that he needed were were in JE2448 unless they didn't exist at that time in JE2448. You know, you can get into the article. We're not going to solve that today, but there is really good textual reason to think that it's added. And again, the passage doesn't make sense. Like I said, it just thematically doesn't make sense. It talks about St. Peter Paul appearing to Constantine, but in the Latin version, there is no St. Peter Paul until they appear all of a sudden. It just comes across as a copy and paste job and they screwed up. Um, so it's uh, the eternal details and the contextual historical details inveigh against the Latin being original. Now, the motivation between the Greek and Latin differences is clear. The Latin's subtly too extreme, right? 
Now, let me get into some of this. Now, the passage in the Latin asserts that Rome was given Peter's keys in a singular honor, singular honor, and quotes Matthew 16, 18 twice, twice on this po uh, point, unlike the uh, original letter. Now, no ecumenical council ever ascribes the keys to St. Peter exclusively. Um, as I, I detail my book and people can read it in my, I have an Orthodox papal quote mine or wherever you want to get this stuff. It's theoretically all bishops are actually successors of Peter. And so to say this is the keys are a singular honor would remove the keys from the other bishops who all mm -hmm. lay claim to the same keys. Now, just so people are aware, St. Pope Agatho lacks any mentions of the keys in, a, in, in the, the letter that everyone loves quoting. His proof text is John 21, 15 to 17. The Fifth Ecumenical Council nowhere endorses papal prerogatives. There's not a single mention of it in Chalcedon. In Ephesus, the papal legate Philip does assert that Peter received the keys of heaven from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the human race. He lives and performs judgment until now and always through his successors. And that's quoted in the July 11th minutes. You can read that uh, Price, Ephesus, page 377. But even then, this is not claimed to be a singular honor as Nicaea II does, mm -hmm. right? Yep. It's saying this is a Petrine exclusive to Rome that gives Rome an ultimate authority, right? So this is something that would have been very bizarre if no other interpatriarchal document ever makes this claim. But somehow it finds its way into this very suspect addition to the Latin. Now, we also know that there's actually even friction over the non-exclusive claims in Ephesus, right? If you read those minutes on that page, you'll see that they actually push back against that. So the fact that a non-exclusive claim was controversial, how controversial would the claim that it's a singular honor be? It sounds like we're making much out of nothing, but this would not have been nothing at the time. This would have been very, mm. very important. It also is worth saying in Nicaea 2, the sixth session quotes Matthew 6 and 18 and it applies it to, to quote it, the whole church of God. All right. So the actual interpretation of Matthew 16, 18 in the Latin version contradicts what we have in the genuine undisputed part of the council in session six. And then you can read that Menham's trans translation, page 406. I like I actually prefer Menham because he takes priority of the Greek minutes, while the price translation takes priority of the Latin minutes, which are the ones that are screwed around with Anastasius. So that's obviously problematic. Um so anyway, the whole idea that Rome has a singular Petrine honor from God without the church's consent, as the Latin letters delineates, was either invented from Anastasius out of whole cloth, all right? So that's a possibility because it only comes from his hands. We have no other document that says this. Or it was inserted into the Latin. Or he added the original Latin, all right? So maybe Anastasius really was a good boy. He found the original Latin letter, which had this stuff, and he play, put it in place the Greek, of the original of the original Greek he was supposed to be translating, right? And just so people know, Anastasius actually claims that he's sometimes taking original Latin documents and replace and instead of translating the Greek, uses the original. So he actually even admits that he's tampering with his own translation. It's pretty amazing that people trust it, honestly. I mean he admits to it, so it's 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 very bizarre. Now in either event, this monumental though subtle change in Roman interpatriarchal claims is bequeathed solely by Anastasius' head. There's no, nothing the critical edition shows that this is quoted in the Caroline books or the treaty or the Council of Paris or the letters between Charlemagne and Adrian. It only exists from Anastasius. So we just have to trust him. When he himself says, I found it in the original, you know, okay, I believe you. <laughs> so anyway, it should be noted that there's some precedent for the claims in this letter um, in intra-patriarchal context. So, for example, in the apocryphal Decretum of Colossium, it asserts that, to quote it, the, the Holy Roman Church is given the first place by the rest churches without a synodical decision, but from the voice of the Lord. All right? So it doesn't go quite as far. It doesn't say that this is a singular honor, but it definitely downplays the need for consent. And this was because at that time, the Byzantines were deposing popes and, and siding with Laurentius, which is a pro-Byzantine pope. Um, I cover that in History of the Papacy, but this was a, uh, a forgery that never had traction, just so people know. So, but that existed in the West, just so people know. And the Caroline books, it actually quotes this, right? So that passage from the Decretum of Galassanium, um, though I, you know, I personally think it's from the 8th century. Most scholars say it's from the 6th century. Um, our earliest manuscripts are from the 8th century for that, that decretum. 
but it's quoted in the Caroline books. How do they understand it? All right. They quote that quote in book one, chapter six, but then accuse the Pope of various errors and, and, and lure detail for the rest of the book. And so <laughs> the point is, okay, people use these honorifics, but they didn't actually take them serious. And our proof is we have a source that quotes it and it literally doesn't take it serious. So it's not my <laughs> opinion. It's just a, it's just a fact. Um, yeah. And so that is my coverage of Nicaea 2. And so if you have any other questions, I, I'll answer them. Um, yeah, wow. I, yeah, as I said before, you answered the main devil's advocate question I had in mind. Like, oh, what about, what if Anastasius actually had the original and it was the Greeks who did the conspiracy tampering stuff? But no, it seems actually, no, we got the, we got the precedent, we got critical silences, and we got Anastasius admitting to, to uh, some tomfoolery on his part. So uh, I don't really have any uh, any more questions. Um, you know, so and you know, I really just think the textual critics are not doing as good a job as they could otherwise do because we have four different text types, traditions for the Greek. For Anastasius Latin, there's one. That's it, one. Wow. So it's like the Quran versus the Bible. The Quran, there's just, you know, Uthman's recension, and you're not, you don't even know because they're all destroyed what the... The, the, the differences in the development of the Quran were because they're all destroyed. You only have one official version. Mm -hmm. That's Latin Nicaea too. The Greek, we actually have slight slight differences, but they agree in all the important parts. So that actually shows we have several different attestations to the Greek. So this idea that uh, Dr. Lambert and Wallach, uh, the Wallach more weekly, uh, they contrived that somehow Photius altered all the Greek manuscripts on earth and he, and he made subtle differences in these different text types. It, it's just, I don't see how it's honestly defensible. It's so much easier to say that the Latin doesn't make sense contextually. Yeah. The fact that the Latin, um, that Anastasius himself is not making accusations, which he could have made if the Latin was uh, altered at that time, I think this indicates the Greek was always consistent and the Latin was changed when Anastasius translated it. And just by the way, Anastasius admits he's pulling from original letters and, you know, and choosing whenever he pleases to use the Greek. And then when he doesn't feel like it, using the original Latin. And so, like, you actually have proof that he's not being consistent. You have proof that there's no independent verification to the accuracy of the Latin minutes. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing that I think... It's, it's a shame that we're going to have to wait probably another 100 years for this issue to be seriously revisited because, quite frankly, no one's going to translate Nicaea 2 again. Uh, the book business is a money business. There's no money in doing it. Father Rich Price did a good job translating it. But the textual critical basis for it is highly faulty. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And as a uh, as a reminder for people, Q&A questions will be happening at the very end. So when Craig asks for questions, he's asking for any questions I may have. But otherwise, audience questions as people give them here and as supporters give them either here or more preferably on the Discord server so that I can find them easier and prioritize them first. Um, those will be all given at the very end of the presentation. Um, interesting. Uh, we got actually, would you like to take an Alan Rule uh, objection? Sure. All right. He says, I disagree. Ephesus is singular. So is Lateran 649. Well, no, well, Ephesus actually isn't singular. The The Latin manuscripts of Ephesus are actually very useful because they contain um, little introductions to each session, which the Greek don't, and it helps us contextualize things. Um, and St. Cyril actually admits to altering the minutes of Ephesus. And the altered version is actually the one canonized in Chalcedon, which is interesting. Like he admits, yeah, this stuff wasn't in the original council, but we needed it. Um, I actually cover that, I think, in the article on conciliar fundamentalism and Anastasius' invention against it. Right. Um, as for Latin 649, there's a, both a Greek and a Latin. And the scholars actually believe that because they're so similar they actually think that the council might have never occurred and it was a literary creation of saint maximus i think that's a little too extreme but i also think when they when they say well saint maximus wrote the script but they really actually played the script i i don't i'm not joking dr phil booth actually says that in the introduction ladder 649. um and so the scholars actually think unlike Ephesus, where we have diversity, that Latin 649 is problematic because there is no diversity. I don't personally find it problematic, actually, just so people know, I don't personally find it problematic. But standard textual criticism is when you don't have diversity, you have problems because diversity helps you verify things. Otherwise, what are you, otherwise, what are you critiquing, 
right? If I don't have different, if I don't have different ingredients to compare, what am I critiquing as a textual critic? You need the diversity. Um, and, and just so people know, and, and, and Alan Rule, I think is the more charitable critics I have that I'm giving evidence who sounds like, who sounds like the person who's actually seriously interacted with this stuff, the person calling names and the person say non secateurs and go in all different directions are the person actually citing the sources and going into detail about the context of sources, their origin and what the scholars say in the footnotes of those scholars. Mm. I just want to challenge the audience that because I know what I'm saying sounds extreme. But again, the evidence is what has to be evaluated. Either present a better interpretation of evidence. And if you don't have interpretation that even makes sense, then it shows you what I'm presenting is the most compelling presentation evidence that you can have. The, this hinges on the evidence, not on rhetoric and, and, and silver tongue sophistry. Mm, right, right. So you'd say for Lateran uh, singular, this is talking about the singular honor uh, issue, I, I assume, when uh, when Alan mentions that? or uh... Oh, I, th I thought he saw the text type. Again, quote quote the word in emphasis, singular honor. It's not there. Oh, okay. You know? Okay. And, and Lateran. Now, now Lateran now, 649 does talk about um, from St. Peter you know, them having the keys, um, but in nowhere denies that this is something that's denied to everyone else and nowhere yep. says that this is without the consent of the church. These are very specific claims that are put right. forward in um, Nicaea too. So that's my point. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Thank you, Anastasia San, for diligently finding the originals. Thank you, man. Very cool. Very that's cool. Right. The thanks to okay. Anastasia. All right, next big one. Uh, we have the alterations to the formula of Adrian the Second, I believe. Um, that's right. Now, this is more popularly known as the Greek formula Hormistas, but it really isn't. It's actually a confession of Adrian II that you have to sign during Constable 869, 870 in order to be in communion with him. Now, Anastasius, going by Dr. Shane uh, Babicki's chronology, was likely back in Rome after uh, the murder of Adrian II's family, as we discussed previously, and probably was brought back because this council is going to exist concern happened in Constantinople and the Franks wanted Anastasius to have to say it was going to happen, right? In fact, Anastasius, not so coincidentally, shows up at the council and helps draft the canons of the council. And we're going to find out in a second, does quite a bit more than that, which is highly suspicious. Um, and so the important point at issue is the deposition of Photius in retaliation to the deposition of Pope Nicholas, which had occurred. Now, this formula of Adrian II um, is in a pretty weird council because only like 12 people even took part in it for like almost the entire council until like a year later, right after uh, Photius was deposed. Um, so it's like almost no one took part in this thing because it was a joke is the reality of it. Now, because it's a joke, some really like outrageous things are said in this council, which we, we don't find elsewhere. And for example, the legates of Rome are called prophets on page 187, Price's translation. Um, Pope Nicholas is called, to quote, an instrument of the Holy Spirit. And there's other odd stuff. There's this one passage where the Pope, where it says, the Pope raised his mouth to heaven and spoke like, like he's a prophet or something. You know, it's it's very, very weird stuff that you don't find. Again, if you read a ton of conciliar minutes, it's just like, it's bizarre. You don't see this. And it takes someone creative to come up with this. And Anastasius, um, being the ghostwriter of Adrian II, is a pretty good candidate for that. <laughs> now, the libel, the libelli or the formulas uh, to Adrian II swearing fealty to the Pope, um, and the minutes of the council itself, so both of them were, according to Anastasius, stolen by the emperor and pirates. And we could read about the emperor, page 45 of Price's book, and the pirates in Chadwick's East and West, 166 and 167. So uh, you got to love when pirates are the reason documents disappear. But luckily, <laughs> luckily, though Anastasius was officially acting as legate to the Frankish imperial delegation, and in no supposed capacity for the Pope, he personally acquired all the libelli in the minutes. He got him back from the pirates and the emperor, and he he saved the minutes. You know, thank thank you, Anastasius. Let's go. That's the truth. Just some people know that really is the story. I, I mean, of course, I'm saying it funny because it is funny. Um, that, that is that is the official story. So the textual history that Anastasius admits to really sounds kind of. Like stuff was manipulated, right? It doesn't sound very kosher. Right. 
Now, this wasn't the only time they were lost and then retrieved by Anastasius' admission. All right, so this is not the only time. So we can read this in page 62 in Price's book that Anastasius, according to him, consulted, um, actually, no, this is Montanero's words, consulted a second Greek manuscript supposedly brought to Rome. That's his words, not mine. In the middle of him translating the Council of Minutes into Latin. So apparently another Greek manuscript saying different stuff was brought in so then he could translate it accordingly. So obviously we're seeing these multiple layers of supposedly lost documents that are retrieved and then alterations made based upon what was supposedly retrieved. Very, very, very bizarre. But again, if this is the only guy you have for the minutes, mostly, there, there is a Greek version of that council, but it's kind of a condensed version. So um, it's missing things. So you, for the full thing, you kind of rely on Anastasius. The problem is Anastasius is a, is a lying bastard. So... <laughs> you, you have a problem there, you know, but it's all you have as the historian. You got to work with what you got. Mm. So the wording of the libellus preserved in session one of the Greek minutes asserts, I'm going to read it. So this is the libellus of Adrian II in the Greek, translate to English. Um, you can read it in Manzi, volume 16, column 316. And just so people know, this matches the description of the Greek given in session four of the council. And you can read that page 271 in Price's translation. It says this. The chief means of salvation is that we in no way deviate from the decrees of God and the fathers. Following all things, the ordinances of the fathers, we anathematize all the heresies. We embrace with all our heart whatever the authority of the apostolic throne decreed concerning Ignatius. I, name bishop of such and such church, have made this profession of argument, and by my hand I deliver to you a most holy despot and great pontiff and ecumenical father, Adrian through the legates. All right, so... That's the letter um, and what it says. What's the Latin What's the Latin ad? All right. The Latin ad to quotation to Matthew 6 and 18. This is similar to the additions made to Nicaea 2, not coincidentally, but it, generally it's following the formula of hormistas, right? So hmm. in the Latin, it reads much more similar to the formula hormistas. It doesn't in the Greek. Hmm. Now it adds in the Latin, the Catholic religion has always been preserved without stain in the apostolic see. So obviously that's following the formula of Hormistus. It adds to the following, uh, adds following the decrees of the fathers, like we see in the Greek. It starts with following the decree of the fathers, but in the second time where, if we remember when we just read the Greek, and maybe you want to show that in the screen if you want to fiddle yeah, I'll around. Do that. I'll do that now. Um, the Greek says, we know we deviate the decrees of God and the fathers. And then it says, Following all things, ordinances of the fathers, right? So there's a parallel. Yeah, we don't we don't depart from the fathers. We follow the fathers, right? That's consistent. Now the Latin starts with we don't deviate from the fathers and God, but then it adds following all things, ordinances of the fathers. In particular, the holy bishops of the ap apostolic see. So the the parallel is broken in the Greek in order to. Put in particular, that's quoting the Latin, the popes being those we cannot deviate from. So a very specific difference is inserted in the Latin. It adds that Ignatius must be revered and that, the quote, the apostolic see has decreed um, that those opposing the pope not be commemorated, which is very curious because the formula Hermistus even was compromised where you didn't have to like stop commemorating certain people, right? Because... Right? Usually in these documents, you got to make those concessions or you're not going to get people to sign them. Um, and so you might want to scroll up so people can see the Greek version uh, um, when people see the Latin there. So there's the Greek. People can read it right there. Um, not in the Greek, obviously. The Greek is on my website if you want to see it. So you can see it yourself. You don't need my translation. You can look at the Greek yourself and the Latin, by the way. Um, it adds a redundant statement about the non-negotiability of communion with Rome. Now, the redundancy... Um, is a, a sign of forgery because it, it's something that that it's just it's it's a peculiar element where if we have a document that's consistent and makes sense versus a document that's inconsistent as redundancies, the 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 peculiar one's more likely the one that's going to have uh, forgeries added. So the Latin adds, as we have already said, we follow the apostolic see in all things and observe all its decrees, right? It doesn't add the part about the fathers like the Greek originally has. We hope for the favor of enjoying the singular communion that the apostolic uh, see proclaims in which is the complete and true totality of the Christian religion, right? Which 
is strange because it's now saying that within Rome itself, which you can find in the pseudo is, is adoring decretals, by the way, that within Rome itself is a singular Catholic communion. It's very bizarre you'd have Greek bishops agreeing to such a thing, right? This is similar to the singular honor stuff. It's like they would not, they would agree to an honorific that's really great about Rome, but not that it's singular about Rome, all right? It's, they, they would not agree to that. Now, it adds uh, to the Pope's honorific, and this is really not terribly important, but uh, it calls the Pope the most holy, thrice blessed, and angelic Lord, the Supreme Pontiff Universal Pope Adrian. And we can read that in uh, the Latin version, in pages 128, 132, Price's translation. Now, it is suspicious that all the high papal parts are missing in the Greek, right? That's suspicious. It's suspicious that it requires not commemorating those who oppose the Pope, a requirement that in the past was dropped from the formula Hermista. So like, why would the real one add a requirement which in reality would probably have to be dropped in order to get anyone to sign the thing? Both letters require that the one signing guarantee it in his own signature, right? So that's bizarre. You have to say, yep, this is really my signature. And the submission required a witness to the signature, an indication that forgery was expected. So like the Latin version says, not only should you have to guarantee I signed this, like we read in the Greek, the Latin adds that the submission of a witness to your signature is necessary. So that's there's funny. this exaggerated emphasis on this thing really isn't forged. The, the thing that was lost to pirates and, you know, reconquered and then a second version was sent back to Anastasius. It's like, wow, you put in a lot of effort saying it's not forged with a very odd textual chain of transmission, right? It's, it's very suspicious. Um, the Latin and Greek, as I alluded to before, begin identically talking about keeping the rule of the Orthodox faith and in no way departing from the decrees of God and the fathers. But instead of repeating this parallel as the Greek does, um, following all things according to the ordinance of the fathers, the Latin veers into a long explanation about Rome. It quotes the formal Hermistas and modifies the Greek sentence by inserting, and in particular, the Holy Bishop of the Apostolic See. And this method of forgery is typical of the pseudo Isidorians, right? To take a real document and then he kind of just shoehorned this sort of Latinisms in about the Pope of Rome. Um, you take real documents and you add these things to make an authentic sounding document. The breaking of the parallelism is an indicator that this is what occurred, right? Just like the pseudo Isidorians. Now, it is possible that people signed blank pieces of paper and the language of liability was picked afterwards in Rome, being that we only get it from Anastasius. So all these all these things aside, it's no wonder there's only 12 people going to these things, this thing, because this thing was a joke. Now, the significance of the proceeding is that while the formula Hermistus was never signed with all this, all of its language intact by the entirety of the church, it was not intended, the key thing, the formula Hermistus was never intended to be an exercise in ecclesiastical submission. That wasn't its point. Its point was for people to essentially admit to Chalcedon. Now, the formula of Adrian is pretty much just an exercise in papal submission. That's its purpose. So that's why like, I could read the formula Hermistas and the letters surrounding like, like Hermistas letter 80 and whatnot, and go, this is really not a document that's, that's really all that important for papal claims. It doesn't make serious papal claims. While I could read the, papal, uh, the letter of Adrian and the subtle changes it makes from the formula Hermistas are of incredible importance because the purpose of the letter was papal submission. That was its intent, unlike the formula Hermistas. And the reason why um, I lost my chain of thought there. So I'll just, I'll just uh, say that and if it comes to me, I'll say it. So like the preceding documents that I just named, now, coincidentally, this formula alone survives by Anastasia's own hands and is allegedly mm -hmm. harrowing exploits to preserve its existence. Not my opinion. That's historical fact. So that's, that's my presentation. Very, very, very fascinating. I think the I think maybe the, I'm looking at the document, maybe the point you lost your train of thought at. Um, where it says the significance of the proceeding is up while the formula of Hermistus was never signed with all of its intact language by the entirety of the church. It was not intended to be an exercise in ecclesiastical submission as this formula of Adrian was intended to be. Was that your thought that you lost or something else? I thought I saw that, but you just said it again. So I say it a third time. There you go. There you go. <laughs> all right. Far out. Already this stuff is crazy. Wow. Epic crazy. I don't have much else to say. So uh, Oh, there's more. Yeah, it gets crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't have much to say. So just head straight on, I guess. Uh, the canons of true. And again, it's all about. It's about the facts, right? It's yep. not in the Greek. The Greek is consistent. The Latin's not. The Latin's got a cockamamie story that I didn't make up. 
So like, <laughs> all right, you know, this is what it is. Um, now, anyhow, Anastasius also denied the full authority of the canons of Trula on grounds other than economia. Now, this sounds like no big deal. It's just, it takes some time to get into this. Historically, canons never fully aligned. Like, we've always had canons with diversity on questions. So canons that were dealt with like laws where the bishop, as a judge, as I alluded to before, has discretion how to apply the law. Now, Trullo issued a list of canons which Rome evidently accepted. Now, the proof of this is that the Liber Pontificalis, which is a, a history of the popes made in Rome, it was a source that was updated during the 8th century, notes that Pope Gregory II appears to have accepted the council. He went to Constantinople and questioned Emperor Justin II, who had convened Trullo, about the council. And after receiving an excellent reply, according to um, the Liber, um, from Justinian II, his earlier opposition to Trullo vanished as the emperor resolved every question. All right. Now, this passage in question is from the 740s, so it's actually pretty close to um, to the Council of Trullo, where it could be reliable. Now, the excellent reply was likely the standard Eastern one, which is likely the last canon of Trullo itself, right? The bishop decides precisely how to apply the canons, right? So, like, if you have this opposition to Trullo saying, I don't agree with all this stuff, but I go, well, you can accept this because you don't have to agree with everything. You don't have to apply everything. It's up to you whether you apply it or not. That's an excellent reply, right? Who wouldn't get down with that? Um, and the reason why I think this is the most compelling is literally the last canon of Trullo. So it's not like me surmising something. It's literally the last canon of Trullo. So like, why wouldn't that make sense? So anyway, it's not surprising that Pope Adrian I and JE2449, the letter to Tiresias, and Nicaea too, by the way, explicitly accepted all the canons of, uh, of Trullo. Now, the quote in uh, Canon 1 Nicaea 2, it says, The divine canons, those composed by the holy apostles, the celebrated trumpets of the Spirit, those published by the six holy ecumenical councils, and by the councils convert, convened locally to the issue of such injunctions, and those of our holy fathers. So that's at page 610 of Price's translation, Nicaea 2. It shows that all the canons are accepted because uh, there was no canons in the real Sixth Council. Trullo was considered the canons of the Sixth Council. So when Rome signed Nicaea II, they accepted all the canons of Trullo, right? And that's why Adrian accepted all the canons of Trullo. Um, it's why wouldn't you if you accepted Nicaea II? Mm. Now, in order to exact pressure over the Bulgarian question, Rome started qualifying its, its acceptance of Trullo. Right now, like they start saying, we never really accepted Nicaea II. We never really accepted Trullo because they, were, they never got what they wanted from Nicaea II. They, they wanted jurisdictions of the Balkans, and that was never given to them. Now, Anastasius the librarian, all right, so now this is where he gets in. He felt it necessary to modify the this, uh, this, this statement that Rome never accepted Trullo because he wanted that Nicaea II be accepted. It was considered politically necessary. Um, the reason why is it was thought perhaps that 869, 870 couldn't be a true ecumenical council unless it weighed in on previous ecumenical council. You, you, you have to read the introduction if you want more information from Montanero on Constable 869, 870 for some of that. But the point is that Anastasius has now reason to reevaluate why Rome doesn't accept all the canons of Trullo. Now, look at the reason he gives, the quote on Asasius. The principal C, i.e. Rome, in no way receives those of these, the canons of Trullo, which contradict either Roman canons or the decrees of the holy pontiffs, i.e. the papal decretals. And we can read that at page 51. It's quoted in, um, in Price's translation of, uh, what do they call it? Concept late 870. Now, Pope John VIII echoed this, perhaps due to Anastasius acting as his ghostwriter as well, or simply just repeating what Anastasius had written. And he wrote that um, Rome accepted all the canons, to quote him, that were not contrary to previous canons of decrees of the Holy Pontiff of this see or good morals. All right. So in effect, instead of maintaining the economic interpretation of canonicity, which is the most likely one Rome had accepted and the whole Eastern Church accepted, Anastasius invented a brand new one that canons are superseded by papal decrees and are canceled if there's any contradiction. Think about that, right? No one else, we don't have anyone explicitly ever saying that until it comes from Anastasius' pen where he says, if they cancel, if they contradict papal holy pontiffs, they don't apply, wow. right? Why is this important? 
because the obvious motivation was to place the papacy on unequal footing vis-a-vis -vis the East, as they can then determine how to apply holy canons and can cancel canons which contradict papal decrees. In effect, it puts the, the papacy over the church's laws. It makes the papacy a law unto itself, which gives Rome leverage in interpatriarchal disputes. And so we start seeing this whole Vatican I idea that uh, the Pope doesn't require consent of the church. Um, they would never say it contradicts canons, but the, what's canonical is determined by the Pope. So the Pope invents his own laws. Who invented that? Anastasius the Librarian. Not my opinion. It, it's, he's the first guy to write it. So there, there it happens again. So that's my coverage wow. of the canon to Trullo. Wow. Okay. Um, let me think. Devil's Advocate, Devil's Advocate. Come on, bring on the papacy. Come on, the other. I need to channel the other Peter right now. I need to get my my, my own you're, Romanist. Your your poor Roman. Your your pro Romans don't have ideas. I don't even give me ideas in the chat. I need a. I need to. Uh, I need to channel the other Peter right now to try and come up with a with a good response. Um, hmm. Oh, I can't think of one right now. This isn't me claiming. Oh, look, Romanists have no response to this. I just legitimately can't think of one right now. <laughs> Actually, we may have one right here from Alec. What about the papal legate's secretary, nullification of Ephesus II during the proceedings and Leo's rejection of Chalcedon Canon 28? In short, this is not a unilateral um, example of Rome overturning the council. Rome, like the other um, pentarchy, has the right to consent to canons. If they don't consent, then the, it's, like, it's like not having the president. It's not like having everyone in Congress sign the bill. Yep. You need universal consensus. That's how the presidency and procedure yep. of ecumenical councils work. And so people wrongly see these things as the Rome acting unilaterally. But in fact, they're just giving their own two cents, which they were entitled to. And by the way, for example, the Church of Milan never accepted in the seventh, in the seventh century um, the third letter of Cyril, even though the Pope of Rome accepted the third letter of Cyril in Ephesus and the fifth ecumenical council. So it shows you Rome's not the only church that can nullify parts of councils like canons and stuff. Other local churches did it. Right. In fact, the uh, the Church of Spain didn't refuse to accept the Fifth Ecumenical Council until the late seventh century. Right, they're in communion with Rome, and they didn't accept the Seventh Ecumenical Council. I mean, the, the Fifth Ecumenical Council, rather. So yeah. it shows you that it's, it wasn't just Rome that could contradict councils. Local churches did it all the time. It's, right. it's just people that don't know the history. They go, look, Rome once did something. It's exceptional. But there's mm. actually absolutely nothing exceptional about it. Yeah. So would you say there's a distinction between um, during or right as a council happened, there's a distinction between not accepting a canon or two as it comes versus having long after accepted it now all of a sudden saying oh we can make canons that contradict it willy-nilly would you say there's a difference oh of course That's yeah different. because yep. like what happens with rome with trullo was yeah we accept everything and then that got reinvent and we accept everything but we'll apply it the way we want to right which let's be honest that's what they do now right like yeah. I, i'm orthodox they violate canons all the time yeah. you're anglican well, they have we church accept, canons we accept the now but we might not tomorrow yeah, and well, in your Anglican, you have church canons. They violate them all the time. It's like they violate yeah, them for breakfast, you know? <laughs> um, so it's so like the idea that someone will violate the canons is, though wrong, it's not scandalous. The idea where someone say, no, what the papal decretal decides is what's canonical. Where do mm. you find that in church history? Mm. You don't. You don't, but you find it first in Anastasius. Yeah, yeah. So it's, there's definitely a key distinction there. The issue... Making distinctions, that's another key thing with history. You can't just look at two things which seem similar, uh, vaguely similar, or even appear quite similar. You've got to actually go into what, what, literally what's happening here, see if they're actually the same or if there's a difference between what's happening. That's a very key thing people need to be able to be able to do with history, not approach things with, a very, with one single or a tiny set of categories, but allow the history itself to form the categories, and then you can compare and contrast. That's, that's a key skill, very, very key skill. Hard to master, but necessary if you're going to do history. Now, spicy one. Uh, let us move to papal infallibility. Yeah, this this one actually surprised me when, when I found out. I, you know, was, I I wouldn't say I almost fell off my chair, but I was like, "You gotta be kidding me!" Anastasius did this too, and yes, <laughs> I, I, it's like again to some people who just maybe are tuning in late. Like, I don't believe in the great man theory. I'm not like a Nietzsche fan or something, right? Like the idea that one guy would do all this is not something I'm inclined to believe. The problem is all the evidence points to it. And so I'm just being <laughs> honest with the history. So 
Papal infallibility. What's the context behind this? Well, Constable III, numerous popes, anathematized Honorius, Pope Honorius as a heretic. And um, this was not actually very controversial, honestly. It probably wasn't even very controversial to Anastasius. Um, Adrian II wrote a letter to Constable 869-870, which is probably penned by Anastasius. And it said this, even though Honorius was anathematized after his death by Easterners, it should be known, and if you want to share this in screen, you could, it should be known that he had been accused of heresy, which is the only offense where inferiors have the right to resist the initiative of their superiors or are free to reject their false opinions. Although even in this case, no patriarch or other bishop has the right of passing any judgment on him unless the consent of the pontiff of the same first see has authorized it. And that's page 314 of uh, 869870 from Price. Now, Papal infallibility was clearly not a concern to Pope Adrian II or Anastasius um, at that juncture. Neither likely even conceived of the idea, in my honest opinion. The I idea, presuming it's novel at first glance, would appear to be insane, right? Like, you know, if this wasn't something that we all knew existed, like just imagine saying there's a guy out there could, that could do a, a hokey pokey and by virtue of that, he can't make mistakes. You go, that sounds pretty crazy, right? You know, so it's a bizarre idea. And so that's why it makes sense that people would not originally even think of such a bizarre idea. Mm. Now, the apologetic against Honorius that I just read, and let me see if you're sharing it on screen. You're sharing it on screen. Yep. The reason why it was made was because it gave Rome everything they were looking for, right? And it met their immediate purposes. Constable three did not contradict papal prerogatives is the point that it's making because it the anathematization of Honorius was proper procedurally, right? And it consent it was consented to by the papacy. In fact, popes until the 11th century would condemn Honorius as a heretic. Mm -hmm. So the whole point that Adrian II through Anastasius' hands is making is that this is no big deal because if a pope is condemned, it can only occur unless a pope consented to it, which is what Adrian II did, right? When he condemned Honorius when he became pope in his encyclical. So mm -hmm. this is, why is this relevant? Because he's saying Photius couldn't condemn Nicholas. Photius couldn't anathematize Nicholas. Photius couldn't depose Nicholas because I didn't consent to it, right? That's the point. I consented to Honorius, that's why it's legitimate. I did not consent to Nicholas. That's illegitimate. So the polemical point is clear, right? So it's like now in the 21st century, I could quote this and use it to, to pwn Roman Catholics and go, look, this is proof of that popes admitted to popes being fallible, right? But yeah. if papal infallibility wasn't invented yet, right, they wouldn't think they conceded anything, right? If it wasn't invented yet, this passage is actually very pro-papal. It doesn't sound pro-papal because we're looking at it with 21st century mm. Vatican I eyes. If you're looking at it with 9th century eyes, it's very pro-papal. That's mm. the incredible thing about this passage. Now, um, I personally disagree with one of the logics of this passage, not, uh, that being that um, Nicholas wasn't condemned as guilty of heresy because that was the whole part, point of the Filioque controversy that Photius brought up was that was uh, heresy. Interestingly enough, um, as you well know, because you know the documentary that's coming out, Anastasius the Librarian actually defends um, the Roman view of the Filioque by defending it as the teaching of St. Maximus, right? Mm. So his point is, well, Nicholas wasn't a heretic because we believe what you believe, right? That was his defense. And so, right, if Nicholas wasn't a heretic, as Rome claimed, and Nicholas' deposition wasn't consented to by Rome, then, by Rome's claim, it wasn't legitimate. Now, I don't agree with this because the Fifth, Fifth Ecumenical Council deposed Vigilius. Um, so papal depositions don't need a pope to assent to them. Um, but the point is, this was the argument Rome was making. And it was that argument why they were able to accept that Norris was a heretic. So the question is, what changes that? What changes? Well, after Adrian II's death, Anastasius started translating the polemical works of St. Maximus. Now, Maximus clearly entertained an idea of Roman defectibility. This comes up uh, in Lateran 649 and his discussions in Lateran 649. Um, this is my opinion. Orthodox disagree with me, but I think this is the most honest understanding of St. Maximus. Now, Roman defectibility means the Church of Rome, its whole synod, will not fall into error. 
it you know it doesn't mean the pope individually cannot fall into error i mean pope marcellinus apostatized he's a saint in the orthodox church the serbians venerate him um Pars pope marcellinus apostatized um uh, pope honorius is a condemned heretic uh, pope liberius signed the semi-arian creed um so the idea that an individual pope um well, you know, would not have error was indefensible. And I don't think St. Maximus imagined that. But the idea that the Roman Synod could somehow weasel its way through, that can make more sense, actually. Because you could argue that, yes, um, when Liberius was in prisons and he apostatized, the rest of the Roman Synod didn't. When Marcellinus apostatized, the rest of the Roman Synod didn't. Um, you know, when Honorius apostatized, the rest of the Roman Synod didn't. Right, so indefectibility broadly could be defended. Individual papal infallibility really can't be. But we're mm -hmm. going to see that doesn't stop Anastasius from trying. So Anastasius reads this passage from St. Maximus. Oops. All the churches of Christians everywhere have held and hold the great church there as their sole basis and foundation because according to the very promises of the Lord, the gates of hell have never prevailed over her. That's in PG 91 137 to 40, uh, it's it's quoted and translated in Butler and Kalarafi Keys in the 2004 edition, pages 352 to 353, right? So this is in the Greek. It's not some Latin forgery, right? It is not clear whether this or the alterations made to Pope Adrian II's letter, like were the eureka moment for Anastasius to concoct papal infallibility, right? Or maybe it's just a creative guy, honestly. I don't have the answer to this question, right? He did all this other creative stuff, made creative stories with pirates and all that stuff. So <laughs> it's it's not, a, you know, maybe he's just playing creative, but my inkling is he read this in Maximus after Adrian II's death, because right during Adrian II, they had no problem saying the Pope could be fallible. Mm -hmm. He reads this in Maximus and it gives him an idea, I think, right? Because he's translating the works of Maximus and he invents papal infallibility. Now, and not any idea, right? However, how he devised it, the point is his hand is the first to write it down. His letter to John the Deacon in Rome argues in defense of Honorius by saying this, not even through the agency of Honorius has there been found any trace of the serpent. And that's quoted in Brown and 7th Century Saints, page 157. All right. Now, typical hmm. of later Roman apologists, Honorius, then, uh, Honorius, uh, Anastasius then starts ad hocing like crazy. Several contradicting reasons, by the way, as to why Honorius was not a heretic. All right, here are the contradicting reasons. They're quoted in the same book, pages 151 and 153. Supposedly, Pope John the Fourth. here are the reasons. Pope John the Fourth's Apologia correctly identified that Honorius was not attending something heretical. All right, that's he one reason. He didn't it, guys. It's okay. Yeah, he didn't. All right, uh, correctly, I um, didn't attend it. Number two, Pope Honorius was not a full-blown heretic because he was not argumentatively obstinate, right? So meaning, yes, he wrote something heretical, but like he didn't keep writing it. Like he wasn't really argumentative about it or anything. By the way, that's not true because Honorius wrote follow-up letters where he doubled down. But again, this is ad hocing, right? Mm -hmm. Third, he didn't really write the letter. So we went from he didn't attend it to he wasn't being argumentative to he didn't even really write it. So we have that <laughs> excuse. Um, I'm not making this up. Go read it. <laughs> that's really what he's doing. Um, then the excuse, he did write the letter, but his scribe handed him and added the heretical statement. You gotta love that. By the way, that's not, the, we actually have writings from the scribe, but we know that's not the case, but again, ad hoc. <laughs> um, he did write the letter, but his scribe did not question Honorius enough, resulting in the, resulting that the criterion of argumentative obstinence was not met. So meaning like, um, Honorius said, uh, write this, Mr. Scribe, and it's a heresy. And the scribe just said, are you sure about that, Davy? Right, he like he didn't ask that question, and so then he's not the blame. So, and then here's my favorite: it's not right to judge people. He then quotes Luke six thirty seven, and Pope Honori should literally, I'm quoting it on a be given the benefit of the doubt. Hashtag don't judge, guys. Hashtag only God. Don't can judge. judge. So, <laughs> right. So to defend people, so like as we've noticed, the the twenty first century Roman Catholic apologist isn't the first person to ad hoc like crazy nauseatingly right in order to defend people infallibility the in order to defend that there's no trace of the serpent and honorius we just saw the amount of ad hocs that had to be made that trip over each other they're just crazy and ridiculous and ahistorical mm -hmm. so 
it's it, I'm guessing at this point Anastasius was getting older and didn't realize how ridiculous this was. Um, but this is what happened. Um, so this are, are all these reasons can you uh, did you get all of these from a specific source or are they like disparate? Yeah, Anastasius' letter. It's okay. his it's his letter to John the Deacon, pages 151, 153 in Brown and Seventh Century Saints. Okay. So this is where it is, people. So he gives all those reasons as like in so the one. so the origin of papal infallibility with all the ad hocs it just never changed since then right because the, the, the doctrine is so crazy you need all the ad hocs because it and just it, doesn't apparently work apparently it's also the origin of the evangelical white girl only god can judge me <laughs> you said it not me i so, saw it. <laughs> so there you go fascinating now, that is spicy so now this was obviously so innovative right because Anastasius and Adrian II never even thought about it a few years beforehand. No one seized upon any of these defenses of Honorius for the next two centuries, right? They're like, oh, we'll just keep going to condemn. We're going to just keep condemning Pope Honorius, right? No one took this seriously. And they just continued anathematizing Honorius at their enthronement. So this sort of letter to John the Deacon is more of like an in-house thing. It's almost like an eternal memo where like people decide how do we deal with this or what should we do with this and Anastasius just gives a speculation and maybe right if someone wrote back saying this is crazy he might have wrote back and said i don't agree with this anymore right but the point is he came up with it and he invented it and and it had <laughs> problems rock, right off the bat <laughs> had problems right off the bat now the innovation so the question that becomes well what motivated him instead of just like right because i don't think Anastasius was crazy so the question is what's the motivation well it appears to be relevant uh because He's reinventing the authority ascribed to ecumenical councils, right? This is the really in-depth thing, right? This is my letter, uh, my article about um, the, ep 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 the epistemology behind conciliar infallibility, which as a Protestant is insane and crazy and stupid and convoluted. Oh, yeah, it is. You know what I mean? And if you say that, I believe me, it makes sense that you say it, right? But the problem mm -hmm. is that's what the early church believed, right? And so the problem with that epistemology is it locks you into canonical norms, yeah. which which would have prevented Rome from meeting their geopolitical aims under Anastasius. Yeah. It's relevant right? if you're a Romanist or an Easterner. Us Prots can say, oh, uh, yeah, we don't care. Romanists and Easterners, uh, not quite. You guys are- Yeah, no, like historically, this is really important because it's not about what people, whether what people believe is right. It's just, this is what they yeah. believed and why they did what they did. So, right, so this is why like, uh, this whole idea of concealing your fallibility, which again, the, the scholars agree and it's in clearly in the fathers and it's just only the apologists who don't read this stuff, you know, they'll, they'll pretend it don't exist. It actually was a point of contention. The first person to oppose it was Anastasius the librarian. And the reason he opposed it because it got in the way of pretty much of Rome exerting itself, right? So Anastasius, like we saw with Trullo, had to place the Pope above councils. Otherwise, councils could depose a pope, right? Or councils could just not consent to what the pope wants. And so Anastasius is, str is stretching for an epistemology where that's not possible, right? That's how ingenious he is. So like, unlike the modern Roman Catholic apologist, which just falls back on it because after the Enlightenment, they feel like they can't have epistemic certainty, that was that had no relevance to Anastasius. His relevance was how are we going to prevent um, Byzantine encroachment in Italy. How are we gonna How are we gonna prevent um, Rome from being outmaneuvered yeah. in the Balkans? These were his concerns, and he devises a epistemology to not to deal with pie in the sky. I don't think I could believe in God if there's no epistemic certainty. The stuff that people in the 21st century yeah. worry about. He was worrying about actual where the rubber meets the road, real geopolitical concerns. This yeah. this was it, the real it, motivation. If someone, if someone came up to him with a whole, oh, I need infallible uncertainty, otherwise I don't know what God is. Anastasius himself probably would have killed your family for that. <laughs> you know, he would have laughed in your face and then poisoned you when you were sleeping, but yeah. <laughs> um, so that being said, let me quote Anastasius, right? So this is outrageous because he actually questions the integrity of the ecumenical council, which if again, if you read first millennium sources, never, ever, ever happens, ever. They they do mental gymnastics to show that these these councils and these saints don't contradict. Like absolute mental gymnastics, to speak as a, like a Protestant in my story hat on, right? It's like absolute mental gymnastics they will do, right? To make these things correspond. Anastasius doesn't do this. What's Anastasius say? How does he avoid the mental gymnastics? Does he say councils could err? Does he say, um, you know, we got to harmonize them? Does he say, 
what, what's he say? Let's see what he says. He says, this is quoted, same letter, John the Deacon, right? Because he's inventing papal infallibility, page 155. Lest we seem to be making an accusation against the council, Council 3, right? Because he's questioning whether they're right over deposing, uh, anathematizing Honorius, right? He's saying they're wrong, right? So he says, unless we are given, we're accused of making an accusation against a council so wholly and venerable, or to criticize it carelessly, we think it fitting for us to consider the, then in the way, consider them, councils rather, in the way we know our holy fathers considered uh, the great council of Chalcedon. One of them, namely Pope Gregory, indicated that this was, the council was to be accepted only to quote, up to the issuing of the canons, right? Mm -hmm. So what we see is Anastasia says we don't accept everything a council teaches, like the, the person being um, deposed, right? Or the person being anathematized. We only accept the canons. And do we remember who decides what canons apply? The pontifical decrees, right? So he just reoriented everything, right? He reoriented, <laughs> reoriented everything. So the papacy has the only real effectual say. Right, it's ingenious, but you're literally seeing them contrive the Vatican One worldview that just didn't exist. It didn't exist six years beforehand in Council Eight Sixty Nine. Didn't even exist six years before, and he see, and we actually see him contrive it. And we also see that he says something similar with Pope Glossius in Tract Tractate Four, where he essentially says that the Pope has the final say in what a council teaches and doesn't teach. And just so people know, and I, it's in my article, um, you guys can read it, the quotations from Gregory Glossius, and I quote the Latin for you, and I have full English translations if you want it, and you can do whatever you want with it, is widely out of context, right? Greg was actually, def Greg, Pope Gregory was actually defending conciliar fundamentalism, right? Like, he's actually literally contradicting what he, by citing Gregory in favor of his new innovative idea, he's literally contradicting Pope Gregory, contradicting Pope Gregory. All right. So in short, being that canons and decrees in Anastasi's view are only in effect uh, in as much as they correspond to papal decretals, this in effect subjugates the role of consensus-based epistemology, right? Because it's epistemic and guaranteeing church-wide infallibility and actually annihilates this view, replacing it with the personal infallibility of the Pope, right? That's the idea. Now, the exact motivation, like I said, is unclear. Um, there was no interpatriarchal dispute at this time. My opinion, it might have been the canonical disputes with Hinkmar of Reims. They were quoting the uh, pseudo Isidorian decretals to each other. And so it's kind of, it's possible that if he could just say that ultimately speaking, it's, it's the papal decretals that are key, that Hinkmar can't quote against him, let's say, ecumenical canons. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's my suspicion. I don't have proof of that. And again, I have to rely on. Uh, on limited extant uh, primary sources that I could read on these issues, right? Now, just think about what this whole thing he could try to lead to. If the Pope is always right, then quoting canons and decrees really cannot af of councils doesn't affect anything. In fact, mm -hmm. disputes with Ro Roman apologists today ultimately become exercises just like with this. So essentially, all that matters is papal decrees. So if you ever have a dispute with a papal apologist, and it, it just all comes down to circular reasoning. The Pope says so, that's what's final. Well, that's actually what Anastasius deliberately designed. The epistemology was made like that by design so he could win arguments for geopolitical reasons, right? So there you have it. Now, I, I just want to give some closing thoughts, maybe if you want, uh, unless you have any questions and I'll give some closing thoughts. Yeah, no, no. Um... Let me think. I'm, I'm just basically giving up trying to be devil's advocate. I'm just like soaking all this up because it's pretty, pretty wild. It's, it's hard. Wild I, I'll stuff. be honest. I think the only person that could devil's advocate this stuff would be me because people have not dived yeah. into this. <laughs> you know, it, ta it takes a lot to dive into this, you know, absolutely, so. but Absolutely true. We could probably, there's probably one thing you can look at. We have a spicy, spicy take right here. Ad hoc mental gymnastics to defend the Pope bad. Ad hoc mental gymnastics to defend councils. Good. How do you respond? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's, again, the issue with harmonizing the saints isn't always literal historicity. Like, yep. for example, the sixth council and the fourth council quotes uh, Apollinarian forgeries, most people think, right? So it's not whether, like, 
There's a little historicity in every point. It's the consensus where we all agree this is what we teach, right? Yeah. And so, like, yeah. and so that's the epistemic. Um, it, there's a there's a intrinsic epistemology to consensus which early church operated under. And if you presume keywords presume upon that epistemology, then the harmonization isn't mental gymnastics. It's being consistent with the epistemology. Just like if you presume upon uh, Anastasius is made up epistemology, then that's not mental gy mental gymnastics either. The difference is my wacky epistemology has a wide historical pedigree, which is arguably from Acts chapter 15, while the Roman epistemology is literally made up on the fly by this murderer and forger, Anastasius. So right, I'll yeah. take I'll take the origin of my epistemology over theirs. Yeah, yeah. There's distinct questions between the absolute question of historical historicity historical vi viability versus historicity and viability in the context of the first millennium church there's 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 distinct questions and it's that latter one which your case is more focused on because arguing with an atheist or a protestant about the viability of ecumenical councils and what they say that, that's one thing but this is this case is very much tailored from how i see it very much tailored to the inter-ortho uh, Romanist dialogue where they accept certain presuppositions about the nature of the council's authority. And so when you start with those things, those presuppositions, and then you look at the history, your argument is that it's a massive, well, massive L for that, That's why to the Protestant, the outsider looking in, when you speak to a Roman Catholic, they'll talk about consensus, like all oh, the fathers determine things. Yeah. But right, that disappears against Orthodox because it doesn't work anymore. And and yeah. Asasius was aware it didn't work, which is why he invented a whole other epistemology, right? You know, so it's um, all I can tell you is like you and I could have a good debate over what epistemology we should uh, confront the mm -hmm. Christian religion with. That's a good discussion to be had. Um, in my uh, critique of Truth Unites, it's actually one of my very central premises in my critique. I think there is a there is a difference in epistemology. But the point is, yep. historically, the epistemology I'm expounding, even though it sounds bizarre to people, that's, it's because they haven't read the history. That is the historical epistemology of the church. It doesn't mean I always apply it perfectly. I'm a fallen, <laughs> fallible, stupid person. Deny but that premise. That, that is no, the no, historical no. epistemology. Just keep it, keep it, keep it. Uh, note, people, that's Craig's opinion here. I do not grant that premise. <laughs> that this was always the epistemology of the church, but uh, that's another, another discussion. <laughs> well, it's. I have a book well, that details it from the first century. You know, so it's. Uh -huh, it, uh -huh, it's sure, it goes very sure. early on. I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. Anyway, we have a. You know. Super chat comment from Jonathan Asius. He doesn't even need to give super chat. That's how awesome the guy is. He's a mad supporter and he gives a super chat. Anyway, Craig, papal infallibility vested in one Papa Frankie Lameo. Also, Craig, conciliar infallibility vested in a bunch of normie, ecumenist, orthodox bishops. Oof. How do you respond to that? Well, luckily it needs consensus because we've actually had way worse than what we have now. And that was in the seventh century. Almost the whole church went into monothelitism. Um, including Rome, they went to communion with uh, they went communion with the monothelites. That's a undisputed fact. So it's just uh, it's been worse. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Take it back, so, Craig. Take it back, Craig. Michael Lofton could defend this easy. Just needs some nuance. My uh, epistemology not, is whatever Michael Lofton says. I win. I have no comment. I'm, I'm not looking. You know, again, people will attack me for like I'm the I've been called the one who should not be named. And the end of the day, I don't need the name. The point is, I brought up the evidence. Yeah. What is your interpretation of the evidence? What is your explanation that all these papal doctrines, without exception, originate from one man's hands? What is your explanation for it? And do you have one that makes sense? Mine does. So. Fair enough. Match not a Craig knowledge on church history. Truly astonishing. Great stuff. Oh, I don't know. Maybe this is people call my knowledge church history a nothing burger. I I would I would put that in dispute. <laughs> I, I I would venture to guess I've I have read much more in depth than the people that are talking about nothing burgers. So fair enough, fair enough. Well, people, we are now on to the Q and A. So as is usual, super uh, support super chats and supporters of all tiers will get priority for questions. Um, starting from, well, the highest supporter, highest tier supporters, and then also going down through that list uh, of lower and lower tiers, but also super chats. So basically, 
whoever whoever gives me the most, they get to go first. Um, then we go on to free questions, and we don't have many supporter questions, so this should be. Should How about be give me the easy. most? Give the give the churches of Cambodia something, cheap bastards. No, nah, I'm I'm better. <laughs> I heard that little comment, that little that little but, thing. What 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 goods what goods evangelism? We don't need that. All right, catch your boss. See ya. See you later. Okay, so the man he gave this as a joke question, the supporter question chat, but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give it anyway because hey, you gave this question, I'm gonna ask Craig from J Athanasius. Why no become Lutheran? Um, I don't know. I'd have to move to the ghetto with ghetto Lutheran. I don't know if I want to do that. Do a do a reverse Jaroslav Pelikan. I I, <laughs> I am a former Lutheran. People, I don't know. Do people know that? I'm baptized a Lutheran. Bat- no, I was baptized a Lutheran. You're baptized, but then you Lutheran, but you. I thought you went to a Baptist. I was church. in the ELCA. Then I went to my wife's church, which was PCA. Then when we got married, the local Reformed church was Baptist, and then okay. we converted the Orthodoxy. That okay, yeah. So that was your life. Okay, that makes sense because I saw your yeah. videos from just before you became Ortho and some of your blog stuff, and you were saying like, "Oh, look at me, I'm Baptist. I'm I'm a Baptist." <laughs> Not quite. Yeah, that, but, uh, it's. It's there. There's certain things about uh, creator baptism which, in the source material, is stronger than people at on. L L. Sorry, Jay. You asked it. I asked it anyway. ELCA doesn't count as Lutheran. <laughs> well, I was there before they actually officially allowed for homosexual marriages, um, but they had they had female bishops and stuff, and sadly that does create issues when we we break the canonical norms of the church. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, now, the cool, good news for other people, for people who ask questions in the chat, uh, is that I have learned, I've just found out of uh, StreamYard's feature where you can actually uh, star comments so that it actually puts them into a little side tab. So even if there's like a super massive long live chat, if I just put a star on a comment, it'll be separated into a little tab so I can easily access it later. So I will Oh, here they are. To- yeah, That's exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I won't have to do the crazy twelve years of scrolling just to get to one question up at the top. So About I time. can actually get straight to this question, which was given technology. Right That's it, technology man. Love Streamyard. Thank you guys at Streamyard. Shout out. I can get to this question right now. That was from the very beginning of the show from Peccator Justificatus. The high view and esteem that Irenaeus, Cyprian, and others had for the Church of Rome proves somehow the papacy. No, because Cyprian did not have. He had a high view. But not the high view you think he had. <laughs> yeah. he, you know, Irenaeus had a high view, but not the high view you think he had. They, they yeah. again, they ascribed explicitly to consensus-based ecclesi- ecclesiology. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, um, and by the way, so did the Church of Rome. I've got letters from the Church of Rome that say the same thing. So. Yeah, and um, the the thing is, it's the the thing that Craig is challenging historically, and that we, in general, as Protestants and Orthodox, do. We're not challenging a vague assertion of a high view of Rome. We're challenging specific propositions and assertions, very specific ones, um, which can be classified as a high as a high view of Rome. But there's also other ideas that can be classified as a high view of Rome, which we wouldn't object to, such as what Irenaeus would give, where he functionally the kind of authority he ascribes to Rome is kind of like an intellectual authority, almost analogous to like a, a really high tier scholar in a field whose uh, whose judgment you defer to. Um, they're definitely, which is they're, much different to jurisdiction and infallibility and all that. Yeah, in early sources, they're definitely treated as a teaching authority. Uh, St. Yep. Ignatius said they admonish others. Um, Rome is used by St. Ir- uh, Irenaeus as an example of uh, yep. global Orthodox teaching. Yep. Um, you know, Cyprian really gets into Rome being the origin of the Episcopate, which is interesting. So it's uh, it's Rome is important. It just doesn't mean all the stuff that Anastasius invented, right? <laughs> Those are two very different yeah. things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, next question. Uh, any more? Just making sure there's no other... Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, blah, 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 blah. Let's... Uh, yep, no, next question. There, there's something in the supporter chat. It's not really a question, but I'm not sure about... Eh, it's not It's not like inappropriate or anything, but I just like... It, there's like personal... I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll, sorry, Indig, if you wanted me to ask that, I, uh, I'm going to do some... Uh, I'm going to do some prudence and not ask that. I don't know. I don't know. Just making sure. Um, right. Actually, no, wait. No, it's about like, because um, you're, you're doing a, aren't you doing a thing with your bro or? What? I don't know. I thought I remember like there was some thing you scheduled, I think, of like a, I don't know. I don't know. Something nah, with nah. your brother. Nah, no, nah, no. Nah, nah. nah. All right. Anyway. Anyway. Um, enslaved by truth. 
Doesn't the government choose bishops in the Orthodox Church at times, though? Technically, we have that all the time through church history, which I really don't personally like. But the reality is the synod must uh, uh, consecrate the bishop. And on top of that, the lady must say axios. They must consent to the bishop. So, like, it's sort of a sham election in that event, but it's an election all the more. So, Fair enough. Questions hey, for Craig? You know, we, Does... uh, we live, you know, just, just think of how many countries on earth, like the Democratic Republic of Congo and Democratic Republic of North Korea. They're democratic, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. But of course they are. All right. Question for Craig. Does the Frankish influence have anything to do with the later Avignon papacy or not? No, because uh, the Avignon papacy, I mean, the Franks continuation is the Holy Roman Empire, which is Germany. And the Avignon papacy is France. I mean, I guess that's ethnically Frankish, but really it's centuries removed. has nothing right. to do with it. Got it. But what about St. Maximus talking nicely about Rome? <laughs> Well, we, we addressed that, that, actually. I, yeah. I addressed that, that Maximus did teach Roman defectibility, but he understood it to pertain to the Roman Synod, right? Mm -hmm. Not the individual of the Pope, because that would have been indefensible. Like I said, we've had apostate popes. So it's, right, like, what's this idea? Pope can't have, our, you know, the Pope is, right? like, it's interesting that a Roman apologist will say, here's something that says that, you know, the Rome keeps the faith unsullied or or something like that, right? And they're like, well, did Marcellinus keep the faith unsullied when he apostatized? Well, no, 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 no. That's not what unsullied means. It means it's only for an ex cathedral. But wait, 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 wait. You quoted Rome would be kept unsullied. And you're saying, I'm supposed to believe that it's not an honorific, but it's ex because that's too interpretive, right? We got to take them at its word. But I have to now, but it doesn't mean unsullied. In every respect, which is if we just look at its word and mean unsullied in every respect, it means an ex cathedra statement to the whole church, blah, 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 right? So, like, mm -hmm. they, they pigeonhole an interpretation that's not what the words mean, right? And so, when Maximus speaks of Roman indefectibility, it would have been defensible in some way, right? Because the whole synod never went into schism. Uh, well, it sort of didn't blame schism. The whole synod never went to heresy um arguably and stuff like that so you could kind of make that sort of argument if you want to right. um what anastasius did was kind of use that as the basis to center it on the person of the pope mm. and why wouldn't you because he controlled the pope right if you you cross anastasius you wake up dead pretty much so like why why would he make the pope the biggest thing ever there you go wow from a Roman perspective, does it even matter if these are forgeries? Once you've got the dogmas in place, how can you honestly appraise the text that led to the dogmas? Is that too simplistic? I mean, unless you think Anastasius is a prophet and, and thereby like an ultramonetist way, by making it up, he revealed essential epistemic and ecclesiastical Roman truths. It just shows the whole Roman system is based on forgeries that were self-serving from one guy over 20 years were quickly pretty much forgotten. Right, because after he's gone, Rome just becomes this middling feudal power again. It's inconsequential, and it's really only the Hildebrandian reforms where this stuff gets picked up again. But the point is, the Hildebrandian reforms, um, like the scholars say, the Hildebrandian reforms is what changed the papacy, but they didn't invent it. The inventor is Anastasius. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Alec, did Rome ever have jurisdiction east of Sardica, Sophia, and Thessalonica? And Thessalonica? The answer is yes. Uh, just like my uh, who started the Great Schism video, uh, local churches started Our by who started the Great Schism video. <laughs> yes, uh, started <laughs> by the whatever church is started by ex apostle. Whoever succeeds that ex apostle would have jurisdiction over that church. So Saints Peter and Paul died in Rome. So really, half the Christian world was under Roman jurisdiction, but that'd mm -hmm. be local. Given your work on the Great Schism, what do you think is more meaningful, Anastasius and the development of papal doctrines or other issues like jurisdiction in Italy and the Filioque? Um, honestly, I actually think it's the jurisdictional issues. Like, Anastasius is an intellectual giant that people don't appreciate. But at the end of the day, if the Crusades never happened or, like, the Crusades turned inward or the Caliphate mm -hmm. did stronger in Spain and the fighting was in Spain or, or whatever, right? Stuff that doesn't break the space-time continuum. Um then Anastasius would have had a few wacky ideas, in my opinion. But it's because the geopolitical trajectory the West underwent 
what Anastasius provided was the epistemology for the Western church to create its parallel church and its schisms mm -hmm. and stuff yeah. and forth the work. But yeah. what the but the practical necessity of the Western schism being that they were invading the you know Asia Minor. Um, the practical necessity is the main historical cause of the schism. Yeah. The the epistemology was just convenient. It would have yeah. been, of course, very different without the epistemology. Yeah, they wouldn't, Anastasius and stuff, they wouldn't have been able to really implement that so massively if not for the... It, it just the would have been a plain, it just would have been a plain schism and it might have just been resolved or it would have been like with the Nestorians or the Miaphysites. It just would have been like very similar churches, but separate, right? But instead, Rome has become a very different intellectual entity and as a result protestantism is a very different intellectual entity you know that's why yeah. like the whole like you take for granted that this consensus-based ecclesiology it's wacky you know harmonizing fathers it's wacky well you never think that if rome didn't start considering it wacky right because that's part of your intellectual <laughs> heritage now so anastasius is the first proto-protestant oh uh, yeah see you later craig have a good one <laughs> maybe i won't maybe i won't go that far but definitely without but without anastasius you wouldn't have protestantism it could have been it could have been a providential thing yeah god can uh god can speak to the man god rose are. up anastasius so there could be other horrible down heresies well god spoke through the mouth of anas he can uh speak to the mouth of anastasius and uh help bring the greatest revival in church history all right ladies and gentlemen this was the epic presentation on anastasius the librarian and how he functionally created the papacy from his own very pen or quill and ink uh, according to Craig Trulia. So you have this presentation here. You can see his blog, uh, his main blog post on this from recently uh, down below in the description to get many of the other details. Um, Craig, this was, this was freaking epic. This was mad, stupidly intense detail as is customary of you and your content. So uh, thanks a ton for coming on and give us your final plugs. Um, plugs would be this has blessed you if you like you learned something you never learned before and you're lying yourself you did it please go to orthodox christian theology.com slash donate again orthodox christian theology.com slash donate support evangelism in the churches in cambodia and pray for me that i may finish my papacy book i'm one third done about you know one, like it's actually getting done it's not gonna take forever to come out i just need to have health and god's blessings and, and it will be finished and I think what people have seen today, actually, this topic is not the most thorough treatment in that book because actually I have less primary sources on this topic than some others. Um, so this will change the discussion forever, I think. I think this stream okay. actually will change the discussion forever. So I hope that's it's, right. It's, hope that's it's, right. It's, great to be, it's great that it was on this channel because I don't have the cool introduction that you have to have made it as neat. <laughs> that is so true. I am. I have just made it even better. People, share the heck out of this stream if you're interested in this topic because it is wild. It is super epic stuff. This is genuine, genuinely some groundbreaking stuff. It's not just trotting over old evidences and old arguments and trying to like spice it up and trying to get some more solid, uh, so, more solid conclusions from them. This is genuinely some stuff that's really not been explored before uh, in our spheres of uh, Roman Orthodox Protestant dialogue and apologetics. So share the heck out of this because this is some epic new information uh go to craig's uh blog posts on the same issue link down below go to his site go to his channel orthodox christian theology and uh yeah that is all for now so craig thank you so much for joining me and would you like to sign out with the wisdom of sirach fight to death for the truth and the lord god will fight for you god bless you amen have a great day amen this has been craig trulia this has been the other paul i hope you all have a lovely day or evening 